This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann David Wyss Chapter 25 My wife began by saying they had not been idle in my absence. They had collected wood and made torches for the night. Fritz and Ernest had even cut down an immense sago palm, seventy feet high, intending to extract its precious pith, but this they had been unable to accomplish alone and waited for my assistance. But while they were engaged in this employment, a troop of monkeys had broken into the tent and pillaged and destroyed everything. They had drunk or overturned the milk, and carried off or spoiled all our provisions, and even so much injured the palisade I had erected round the tent, that it took them an hour, after they returned, to repair the damage. Fritz had made also a beautiful capture, and a nest he had discovered in the rocks at Cape Disappointment. It was a superb bird, and though very young, quite feathered. Ernest had, pro Ernest had pronounced it to be the eagle of Malabar, and I confirmed his assertion and as this species of eagle is not large, and does not require much food, I advised him to train it as a falcon, to chase other birds. I took this opportunity to announce that henceforward every one must attend to his own livestock, or they should be set at liberty, Mama having sufficient to manage in her own charge. We then made a fire of green wood, in the smoke of which we placed the buffalo meat we had brought home leaving it during the night, that it might be perfectly cured. We had had some for supper, and thought it excellent. The young buffalo was beginning to graze, and we gave him a little milk to-night, as well as to the jackal. Fritz had taken the precaution to cover the eyes of his eagle, and, tying it fast by the leg to a branch, it rested very tranquilly. We then retired to our mossy beds, to recruit our strength for the labours of another day. At break of day we rose, made a light breakfast, and I was about to give the signal of departure, when my wife communicated to me the difficulty they had had in cutting down the palm-tree, and the valuable provision that might be obtained from it with a little trouble. I thought she was right, and decided to remain here another day, for it was no trifling undertaking to split up a tree seventy feet long. I consented the more readily, as I thought I might after removing the useful pith from the trunk, obtained two large spouts, or channels, to conduct the water from Jackal River to the kitchen garden. Such tools as we had we carried to the place where the tree lay. We first sawed off the head. Then, with a hatchet making an opening at each end, we took wedges and mallets, and the wood being tolerably soft, after four hours' labour we succeeded in splitting it completely. When parted, we pressed the pith with our hands to get the hole into one division of the trunk, and began to make our paste. At one end of the spout we nailed one of the graters, through which we intended to force the paste, to form the round seeds. My little bakers set vigorously to work, some pouring water on the pith, while the rest mixed it into paste. When sufficiently worked, I pressed it strongly with my hand against the grater, the farinaceous parts passed easily through the holes, while the ligneous part, consisting of splinters of wood, etc., was left behind. This we threw into a heap, hoping mushrooms might spring from it. My wife now carefully spread the grains on sailcloth, in the sun, to dry them. I also formed some vermicelli, by giving more consistence to the paste, and forcing it through the holes in little pipes. My wife promised with this, and the Dutch cheese, to make us a dish equal to Naples macaroni. We were now contented, we could at any time obtain more sago by cutting down a tree, and we were anxious to get home to try our water-pipes. We spent the rest of the day in loading the cart with our utensils and the halves of the tree. We retired to our hut at sunset, and slept in peace. The next morning the whole caravan began to move at an early hour. The buffalo, harnessed to the cart, by the side of his nurse, the cow, took the place of our lost ass, 
and began his apprenticeship as a beast of draught. We took the same road on our return, that we might carry away the candleberries and the vessels of India rubber. The vanguard was composed of Fritz and Jack, who pioneered our way, by cutting down the underwood to make a road for the cart. Our water-pipes, being very long, somewhat impeded our progress, but we happily reached the candleberry trees without accident, and placed our sacks on the cart. We did not find more than a quart of the kuchuk gum, but it would be sufficient for our first experiment, and I carried it off. In crossing the little wood of guavas, we suddenly heard our dogs, who were before us with Fritz and Jack, uttering the most frightful howlings. I was struck with terror, lest they should have encountered a tiger, and rushed forward ready to fire. The dogs were endeavouring to enter a thicket, in the midst of which Fritz declared he had caught a glimpse of an animal larger than the buffalo, with a black bristly skin. I was just about to discharge my gun into the thicket, when Jack, who had lain down on the ground to look under the bushes, burst into a loud laugh. <laughs> it is another trick of that vexatious animal our old sow she's always making fools of us cried he half merry and half angry we made an opening into the thicket and there discovered the lady lying surrounded by seven little pigs only a few days old we were very glad to see our old friend so attended and stroked her she seemed to recognize us and grunted amicably we supplied her with some potatoes, sweet acorns, and cassava bread, intending in return to eat her young ones, when they were ready for the spit, though my dear wife cried out against the cruelty of the idea. At present we left them with her, but proposed afterwards to take away two to be brought up at home, and leave the rest to support themselves on acorns in the woods, where they would become game for us. At length we arrived at Falcon's Nest which we regarded with all the attachment of home. Our domestic animals crowded round us, and noisily welcomed us. We tied up the buffalo and jackal, as they were not yet domesticated. Fritz fastened his eagle to a branch by a chain long enough to allow it to move freely, and then imprudently uncovered its eyes. It immediately raised its head, erected its feathers, and struck on all sides with its beak and claws, our fowls took to flight, but the poor parrot fell in his way, and was torn to pieces before we could assist it. Fritz was very angry, and would have executed the murderer, but Ernest begged he would not be so rash, as parrots were more plentiful than eagles, and it was his own fault for uncovering his eyes, the falconers always keeping their young birds hooded six weeks, till they were quite tamed. He offered to train it, if Fritz would part with it but this Fritz indignantly refused. I told them the fable of the dog in the manger, which abashed Fritz, and he then besought his brother to teach him the means of training this noble bird, and promised to present him with his monkey. Ernest then told him that the Caribs subdue the largest birds by making them inhale tobacco smoke. Fritz laughed at this, but Ernest produced a pipe and some tobacco he had found in the ship and began to smoke gravely under the branch where the bird was perched. It was soon calm, and on his continuing to smoke it became quite motionless. Fritz then easily replaced the bandage, and thanked his brother for his good service. The next morning we set out early to our young plantation of fruit-trees, to fix props to support the weaker plants. We loaded the cart with the thick bamboo canes and our tools, and harnessed the cow to it, leaving the buffalo in the stable, as I wished the wound in his nostrils to be perfectly healed before I put him to any hard work. I left Francis with his mother, to prepare our dinner, begging them not to forget the macaroni. We began at the entrance of the avenue to Falcon's Nest, where all the trees were much bent by the wind. We raised them gently by a crowbar. I made a hole in the earth in which one of my sons placed the bamboo props, driving them firmly down with a mallet, and we proceeded to another, while Ernest and Jack tied the trees to them with a long, tough, pliant plant, which I suspected was a species of liana. As we were working, 
Fritz inquired if these fruit trees were wild. A pretty question, cried Jack. Do you think the trees are tame like eagles or buffaloes? You perhaps could teach them to bow politely, so that we might gather the fruit. You fancy you are a wit, said I, but you speak like a dunce. We cannot make trees bow at our pleasure, but we can make a tree which by nature bears sour and uneatable fruit, produce what is sweet and wholesome. This is effected by grafting into a wild tree a small branch, or even a bud, of the sort you wish. I will show you this method practically at some future time, for by these means we can procure all sorts of fruit, only we must remember that we can only graft a tree with one of the same natural family. Thus we could not graft an apple on a cherry tree, for one belongs to the apple tribe, and the other to the plum tribe. Do we know the origin of all these European fruits? asked the inquiring Ernest. All our shell-fruits, answered I, such as the nuts, the almond, and the chestnut, are natives of the east, the peach of Persia, the orange and apricot of Armenia, and the cherry, which was unknown in Europe sixty years before Christ, was brought by the proconsul Lucullus from the southern shores of the Euxine. The olives come from Palestine. The first olive trees were planted on Mount Olympus, and from thence were spread through the rest of Europe. The fig is from Lydia, the plums your favorite fruit, with the exception of some natural sorts that are native to our forests, are from Syria, and the town of Damascus has given its name to one sort, the Damascene or Damson. The pear is a fruit of Greece, the ancients called it the fruit of the Peloponnesus. The mulberry is from Asia, and the quince from the island of Crete. Our work progressed as we talked thus, and we had soon propped all our valuable plants. It was now noon, and we returned to Falcon's Nest very hungry, and found an excellent dinner prepared, of smoked beef, and the tender bud of the cabbage palm, the most delicious of vegetables. After dinner we began to discuss a plan I had long had in my head, but the execution of it presented many difficulties. It was to substitute a firm and solid staircase for the ladder of ropes, which was a source of continual fear to my wife. It is true that we had only to ascend it to go to bed, but bad weather might compel us to remain in our apartment. We should then have frequently to ascend and descend, and the ladder was very unsafe. But the immense height of the tree, and the impossibility of procuring beams to sustain a staircase round it threw me into despair. However, looking at the monstrous trunk of the tree, I thought, if we cannot succeed outside, could we not contrive to mount within? "'Have you not said there was a swarm of bees in the trunk of the tree?' I inquired of my wife. "'Yes,' said little Francis. "'They stung my face dreadfully the other day, when I was on the ladder.' I was pushing a stick into the hole they came out of, to try how deep it was. "'Now then,' cried I, "'I see through my difficulties. Let us find out how far the tree is hollow. We can increase the size of the tunnel, and I have already planned the sort of staircase I can construct.' I had hardly spoken, when the boys leaped like squirrels, some upon the arched roots, some on the steps of the ladder and began to strike with sticks and mallets to sound the tree. This rash proceeding had nearly been fatal to Jack, who, having placed himself just before the opening, and striking violently, the whole swarm, alarmed at an attack which probably shook their palace of wax, issued forth, and revenged themselves amply on all the assailants. Nothing was heard but cries and stamping of feet. My wife hastened to cover the stings with moist earth, which rather relieved them, but it was some hours before they could open their eyes. They begged me to get them the honey from their foes, and I prepared a hive, which I had long thought of, a long gourd, which I placed on a board nailed upon a branch of our tree, and covered with straw to shelter it from the sun and wind. But it was now bedtime, and we deferred our attack on the fortress till next day. End of chapter.
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann David Wyss Chapter 26 An hour before day, I waked my sons to assist me in removing the bees to the new abode I had prepared for them. I commenced by plastering up the entrance to their present dwelling with clay, leaving only room to admit the bowl of my pipe. This was necessary, because I had neither masks nor gloves, as the regular bee-takers have. I then began to smoke briskly, to stupefy the bees. At first we heard a great buzzing in the hollow, like the sound of a distant storm. The murmur ceased by degrees, and a profound stillness succeeded, and I withdrew my pipe without a single bee appearing. Fritz and I then, with a chisel and small axe, made an opening about three feet square, below the bee's entrance. Before we detached this I repeated the fumigation, lest the noise and the fresh air should awake the bees, but there was no fear of such a thing, they were quite stupefied. We removed the wood and through this opening beheld, with wonder and admiration, the work of this insect nation. There was such a store of wax and honey that we feared we should not have vessels to contain it. The interior of the tree was filled with honeycombs. I cut them carefully, and placed them in the gourds the boys brought me. As soon as I had made a little space, I placed the upper comb, on which the bees were hanging in clusters, in the new hive and put it on the plank prepared for it. I then descended with the rest of the honeycomb, and filled a cask with it, which I had previously washed in the stream. This we covered with sailcloth and planks, lest the bees, attracted by the smell, should come to claim their own. We left out some comb for a treat at dinner, and my wife carefully put by the rest. To prevent the bees returning to their old abode, we placed some burning tobacco in the hollow the smell and fumes of which drove them from the tree, when they wished to enter, and finally they settled in the new hive where the queen bee, doubtless, had fixed herself. We now began our work. We emptied the cask of honey into a large boiler, except a little reserved for daily use. We added a little water, placed the boiler on a slow fire, and reduced it to a liquid mass. This was strained through a bag into the cask, and left standing all night to cool. The next morning the wax had risen to the top, and formed a hard and solid cake which we easily removed, and beneath was the most pure and delicious honey. The barrel was then carefully closed, and placed in a cool place. We now proceeded to examine the interior of the tree. I took a long pole, and tried the height from the window I had made, and tied a stone to a string to sound the depth. To my surprise the pole penetrated without resistance to the very branches where our dwelling was, and the stone went to the roots. It was entirely hollow, and I thought I could easily fix a winding staircase in this wide tunnel. It would seem that this huge tree, like the willow of our country, is nourished through the bark, for it was flourishing in luxuriant beauty. We began by cutting a doorway, on the side facing the sea, of the size of the door we had brought from the captain's cabin, with its framework, thus securing ourselves from invasion on that side. We then cleansed and perfectly smoothed the cavity, fixing in the middle the trunk of a tree about ten feet high, to serve for the axis of the staircase. We had prepared, the evening before, a number of boards from the staves of a large barrel, to form our steps. By the aid of the chisel and mallet we made deep notches in the inner part of our tree, and corresponding notches in the central pillar. I placed my steps in these notches, riveting them with large nails. I raised myself in this manner, step after step, but always turning round the pillar, till we got to the top. We then fixed on the central pillar another trunk of the same height prepared beforehand, and continued our winding steps. Four times we had to repeat this operation, and finally we reached our branches, 
and terminated the staircase on the level of the floor of our apartment. I cleared the entrance by some strokes of my axe. To render it more solid, I filled up the spaces between the steps with planks, and fastened two strong cords from above to each side of the staircase to hold by. Towards different points I made openings, in which were placed the windows taken from the cabin, which gave light to the interior, and favoured our observations outside. The construction of this solid and convenient staircase occupied us during a month of patient industry. Not that we laboured like slaves, for we had no one to constrain us. We had in this time completed several works of less importance, and many events had amused us amidst our toil. A few days after we commenced, Florid produced six puppies, but the number being too large for our means of support, I commanded that only a male and female should be preserved, that the breed might be perpetuated. This was done, and the little jackal being placed with the remainder, Flora gave it the same privileges as her own offspring. Our goats also, about this time, gave us two kids, and our sheep some lambs. We saw this increase of our flock with great satisfaction, and for fear these useful animals should take it into their heads to stray from us, as our ass had done, we tied round their necks some small bells we had found on the wreck, intended to propitiate the savages, and which would always put us on the track of the fugitives. The education of the young buffalo was one of the employments that varied our labour as carpenters. Through the incision in his nostrils I had passed a small stick, to the ends of which I attached a strap. This formed a kind of a bit, after the fashion of those of the Hottentots, and by this I guided him as I chose, though not without much rebellion on his part. It was only after Fritz had broken it in for mounting that we began to make it carry. It was certainly a remarkable instance of patience and perseverance surmounting difficulties, for we not only made it bear the wallets we usually placed on the ass, but Ernest, Jack, and even little Francis took lessons in horsemanship by riding him, and henceforward would have been able to ride the most spirited horse without fear for it could not be worse than the buffalo they had assisted to subdue. In the midst of this, Fritz did not neglect the training of his young eagle. The royal bird began already to pounce very cleverly on the dead game his master brought and placed before him, sometimes between the horns of the buffalo, sometimes on the back of the great bustard, or the flamingo, sometimes he put it on a board or on the end of a pole to accustom it to pounce, like the falcon, on other birds. He taught it to settle on his wrist at a call or a whistle, but it was some time before he could trust it to fly without a long string attached to its leg, for fear its wild nature should carry it from us forever. Even the indolent Ernest was seized with the mania of instructing animals. He undertook the education of his little monkey, who gave him sufficient employment. It was amusing to see the quiet, slow, studious Ernest obliged to make leaps and gambles with his pupil to accomplish his instruction. He wished to accustom Master Nips to carry a pannier, and to climb the coconut trees with it on his back. Jack and he wove a small light pannier of rushes, and fixed it firmly on his back with three straps. This was intolerable to him at first. He ground his teeth, rolled on the ground, and leaped about in a frantic manner, trying in vain to release himself. They left the pannier on his back night and day, and only allowed him to eat what he had previously put into it. After a little time he became so accustomed to it that he rebelled if they wished to remove it, and threw into it everything they gave him to hold. He was very useful to us, but he obeyed only Ernest, who had very properly taught him equally to love and fear him. Jack was not so successful with his jackal, though he gave him the name of the hunter, yet for the first six months the carnivorous animal chased only for himself, and if he brought anything to his master it was only the skin of the animal he had just devoured. But I charged him not to despair, and he continued zealously his instructions. 
During this time I had perfected my candle manufacture, by means of mixing the beeswax with that obtained from the candleberry, and by using cane moulds, which Jack first suggested to me, I succeeded in giving my candles the roundness and polish of those of Europe. The wicks were for some time an obstacle. I did not wish to use the small quantity of calico we had left but my wife happily proposed to me to substitute the pith of a species of elder, which answered my purpose completely. I now turned myself to the preparation of the kuchuk, of which we had found several trees. I encouraged the boys to try their ingenuity in making flasks and cups, by covering moulds of clay with a gum, as I had explained to them. For my part I took a pair of old stockings, and filled them with sand for my mould, which I covered with a coating of mud, and left to dry in the sun. I cut out a pair of soles of buffalo leather, which I first hammered well, and then fastened with small tacks to the sole of the stocking, filling up the spaces left with the gum, so as to fix it completely. Then with a brush of goat's hair, I covered it with layer upon layer of the elastic gum, till I thought it sufficiently thick. It was easy after this to remove the sand, the stocking, and the hardened mud, to shake out the dust, and I had a pair of waterproof boots without seam, and fitting as well as if I had employed an English shoemaker. My boys were wild with joy, and all begged for a pair, but I wished first to try their durability, compared with those of buffalo leather. I began to make a pair of boots for Fritz using the skin drawn from the legs of the buffalo we had killed. But I had much more difficulty than with the kuchuk. I used the gum to cover the seams, so that the water might not penetrate. They were certainly not elegant as a work of art, and the boys laughed at their brother's awkward movements in them, but their own productions, though useful vessels, were not models of perfection. We then worked at our fountain, a great source of pleasure to my wife and to all of us. We raised, in the upper part of the river, a sort of dam, made with stakes and stones, from whence the water flowed into our channels of the sago palm, laid down a gentle declivity nearly to our tent, and there it was received into the shell of the turtle, which we had raised on some stones of a convenient height the hole which the harpoon had made serving to carry off the waste-water through a cane that was fitted to it. On two cross sticks were placed the gourds that served us for pails, and thus we had always the murmuring of the water near us, and a plentiful supply of it, always pure and clean, which the river, troubled by our waterfowl and the refuse of decayed leaves, could not always give us. The only inconvenience of these open channels was, that the water reached us warm and unrefreshing. But this I hoped to remedy in time, by using bamboo pipes buried in the earth. In the meantime, we were grateful for this new acquisition, and gave credit to Fritz, who had suggested the idea. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann David Wyss Chapter 27 One morning, as we were engaged in giving the last finish to our staircase, we were alarmed at hearing at a distance strange, sharp, prolonged sounds like the roars of a wild beast, but mingled with an unaccountable hissing. Our dogs erected their ears, and prepared for deadly combat. I assembled my family. We then ascended our tree, closing the lower door, loaded our guns, and looked anxiously round. But nothing appeared. I armed my dogs with their porcupine coats of mail and collars, and left them below to take care of our animals. The horrible howlings seemed to approach nearer to us. At length Fritz, who was leaning forward to listen as attentively as he could, threw down his gun, and, bursting into a loud laugh, cried out, "'It is our fugitive, the ass! Come back to us!' and singing his song of joy on his return. 
we listened and were sure he was right, and could not but feel a little vexation at being put into such a fright by a donkey. Soon after, we had the pleasure of seeing him appear among the trees, and what was still better, he was accompanied by another animal of his own species, but infinitely more beautiful. I knew it at once to be the Onagra, or wild ass, a most important capture if we could make it, although all naturalists have declared it impossible to tame this elegant creature, yet I determined to make the attempt. I went down with Fritz, exhorting his brothers to remain quiet, and I consulted with my privy counsellor on the means of taking our prize. I also prepared, as quickly as possible, a long cord with a noose kept open by a slight stick, which would fall out as soon as the animal's head entered, while any attempt to escape would only draw the noose closer. The end of this cord was tied to the root of a tree. I then took a piece of bamboo, about two feet long, and splitting it up, tied it firmly at one end, to form a pair of pincers for the nose of the animal. In the meantime, the two animals had approached nearer, our old Grizzle apparently doing the honours to his visitor, and both grazing very comfortably. By degrees we advance softly to them, concealed by the trees, Fritz carrying the lasso, and I the pincers. The Onagra, as soon as he got sight of Fritz, who was before me, raised his head and started back, evidently only in surprise, as it was probably the first man the creature had seen. Fritz remained still, and the animal resumed his browsing. Fritz went up to our old servant, and offered him a handful of oats mixed with salt. The ass came directly to eat its favourite treat. Its companion followed, raised its head, snuffed the air, and came so near that Fritz adroitly threw the noose over its head. The terrified animal attempted to fly but that drew the cord so tight as to almost to stop his respiration, and he lay down, his tongue hanging out. I hastened up and relaxed the cord, lest he should be strangled. I threw the halter of the ass round his neck, and placed the split cane over his nose, tying it firmly below with a string. I subdued this wild animal by the means that blacksmiths use the first time they shoe a horse. I then took off the noose and tied the halter by two long cords to the roots of two separate trees, and left him to recover himself. In the meantime the rest of the family had collected to admire this noble animal, whose graceful and elegant form, so superior to that of the ass, raises it almost to the dignity of a horse. After a while it rose, and stamped furiously with its feet, trying to release itself but the pain in its nose obliged it to lie down again. Then my eldest son and I, approaching gently, took the two cords, and led or dragged it between two roots very near to each other, to which we tied the cords so short that it had little power to move, and could not escape. We took care our own donkey should not stray again, by tying his forefeet loosely and putting on him a new halter and left him near the Onagra. I continued, with a patience I never had in Europe, to use every means I could think of with our new guest, and at the end of a month he was so far subdued that I ventured to begin his education. This was a long and difficult task. We placed some burdens on his back, but the obedience necessary before we could mount him it seemed impossible to instill into him. At last I recollected the method they use in America to tame the wild horses, and I resolved to try it. In spite of the bounds and kicks of the furious animal, I leaped on his back, and seizing one of his long ears between my teeth, I bit it till the blood came. In a moment he reared himself almost erect on his hind feet, remained for a while stiff and motionless, then came down on his forefeet slowly. I still holding on his ear. At last I ventured to release him. He made some leaps, but soon subsided into a sort of trot, I having previously placed loose cords on his forelegs. From that time we were his masters, 
My sons mounted him one after another. They gave him the name of Lightfoot, and never animal deserved his name better. As a precaution, we kept the cords on his legs for some time, and as he never would submit to the bit, we used a snaffle, by which we obtained power over his head, guiding him by a stick, with which we struck the right or left ear as we wished him to go. During this time our poultry-yard was increased by three broods of chickens. We had at least forty of these little creatures chirping and pecking about, the pride of their good mistress's heart. Part of these were kept at home, to supply the table, and part she allowed to colonize in the woods, where we could find them when we wanted them. These, she said, are of more use than your monkeys, jackals, and eagles, who do nothing but eat, and would not be worth eating themselves, if we were in need. However, she allowed that there was some use in the buffalo, who carried burdens, and Lightfoot, who carried her sons so well. The fowls, which cost us little for food, would be always ready, she said, either to supply us with eggs or chickens, when the rainy season came on, the winter of this climate. This reminded me that the re approach of that dreary season permitted me no longer to defer a very necessary work for the protection of our animals. This was to construct, under the roots of the trees, covered houses for them. We began by making a kind of roof above the vaulted roots of our tree. We used bamboo canes for this purpose. The longer and stouter were used for the supports, like columns. The slighter ones, bound together closely, formed the roof. The intervals we filled up with moss and clay, and spread over the whole a coating of tar. The roof was so firm that it formed a platform, which we surrounded with a railing and thus we had a balcony, and a pleasant promenade. By the aid of some boards nailed to the roots, we made several divisions in the interior, each little enclosure being appropriated to some useful purpose, and thus stables, poultry-houses, dairy, larder, hay-house, storeroom, etc., besides our dining-room, were all united under one roof. This occupied us some time as it was necessary to fill our storeroom before the bad weather came, and our cart was constantly employed in bringing useful stores. One evening, as we were bringing home a load of potatoes on our cart, drawn by the ass, the cow, and the buffalo, I saw the cart was not yet full. I therefore sent home the two younger brothers with their mother, and went on with Fritz and Ernest to the oak wood to collect a sack of sweet acorns. Fritz mounted on his onagra, Ernest followed by his monkey, and I carrying the bag. On arriving at the wood, we tied Lightfoot to a tree, and all three began to gather the dropped acorns, when we were startled by the cries of birds, and a loud flapping of wings, and we concluded that a brisk combat was going on between Master Nips and the tenants of the thickets, from whence the noise came. Ernest went softly to see what was the matter and we soon heard him calling out, "'Be quick! A fine heath-fowl's nest full of eggs! Nips wants to suck them, and the mother is beating him!' Fritz ran up, and secured the two beautiful birds, who fluttered and cried out furiously, and returned, followed by Ernest, carrying a large nest filled with eggs. The monkey had served us well on this occasion, for the nest was so hidden by a bush with long leaves, of which Ernest had his hand full, that, but for the instinct of the animal, we could never have discovered it. Ernest was overjoyed to carry the nest and eggs for his dear mamma, and the long-pointed leaves he intended for Francis, to serve as little toy swords. We set out on our return, placing the sack of acorns behind Fritz on Lightfoot. Ernest carried the two fowls, and I charged myself with the care of the eggs, which I covered up as I found they were warm and I hoped to get the mother to resume her brooding when we got to Falcon's Nest. We were all delighted with the good news we should have to carry home, and Fritz, anxious to be first, struck his charger with a bunch of the pointed leaves he had taken from Ernest. This terrified the animal so much that he took the bit in his teeth and flew out of sight like an arrow. We followed in some uneasiness, 
but found him safe. Master Lightfoot had stopped of himself when he reached his stable. My wife placed the valuable eggs under a sitting hen, the true mother refusing to fulfil her office. She was then put into the cage of the poor parrot, and hung in our dining-room, to accustom her to society. In a few days the eggs were hatched, and the poultry-yard had an increase of fifteen little strangers, who fed greedily on bruised acorns, and soon became as tame as any of our fowls, though I plucked the large feathers out of their wings when they were full-grown, lest their wild nature should tempt them to quit us. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann David Wyss. Chapter 28 Francis had soon become tired of playing with the long leaves his brother had brought him, and they were thrown aside. Fritz happened to take some of the withered leaves up, which were soft and flexible as a ribbon, and he advised Francis to make whiplashes of them, to drive the goats and sheep with, for the little fellow was the shepherd. He was pleased with the idea, and began to split the leaves into strips, which Fritz plaited together into very good whiplashes. I remarked, as they were working, how strong and pliant these strips seemed, and, examining them closely, I found they were composed of long fibres, or filaments, which made me suspect it to be Formium tenax, or New Zealand flax, a most important discovery to us, and which, when I communicated it to my wife, almost overwhelmed her with joy. "'Bring me all the leaves you can without delay,' cried she, "'and I will make you stockings, shirts, coats, sewing thread, cords. In fact, Give me but flax and work-tools, and I can manage all." I could not help smiling at the vivacity of her imagination, roused at the very name of flax, but there was still great space between the leaves lying before us and the linen she was already sewing in idea. But my boys, always ready to second the wishes of their beloved mother, soon mounted their coursers, Fritz on Lightfoot and Jack on the Great Buffalo to procure supplies. Whilst we waited for these, my wife, all life and animation, explained to me all the machines I must make to enable her to spin and weave, and make linen to clothe us from head to foot. Her eyes sparkled with delight as she spoke, and I promised her all she asked. In a short time our young cavaliers returned from their foraging expedition conveying on their steeds huge bundles of the precious plant, which they laid at the feet of their mother. She gave up everything to begin her preparation. The first operation necessary was to steep the flax, which is usually done by exposing it in the open air in the rain, the wind, and the dew, so as, in a certain degree, to dissolve the plant, rendering the separation of the fibrous and ligneous parts more easy it can then be cleaned and picked for spinning. But as the vegetable glue that connects the two parts is very tenacious, and resists for a long time the action of moisture, it is often advisable to steep it in water, and this, in our dry climate, I considered most expedient. My wife agreed to this, and proposed that we should convey it to Flamingo Marsh, and we spent the rest of the day in tying up the leaves in bundles. Next morning we loaded our cart and proceeded to the marsh. We there untied our bundles and spread them in the water, pressing them down with stones, and leaving them till it was time to take them out to dry. We could not but admire here the ingeniousness of the flamingo. They are of a conical form, raised above the level of the marsh, having a recess above in which the eggs are deposited, out of the reach of danger and the female can sit on them with her legs in the water. These nests are of clay, and so solid that they resist the water till the young are able to swim. In a fortnight the flax was ready to be taken out of the water. We spread it in the sun, 
which dried it so effectually that we brought it to Falcon's Nest the same evening, where it was stored till we were ready for further operations. At present we laboured to lay up provision for the rainy season, leaving all sedentary occupations to amuse us in our confinement. We brought in continually loads of sweet acorns, manioc, potatoes, wood, fodder for the cattle, sugar canes, fruit, indeed everything that might be useful during the uncertain period of the rainy season. We profited by the last few days to sow the wheat and other remaining European grains, that the rain might germinate them. We had already had some showers. The temperature was variable, the sky became cloudy, and the wind rose. The season changed sooner than we expected. The winds raged through the woods, the sea roared, mountains of clouds were piled in the heavens. They soon burst over our heads, and torrents of rain fell night and day without intermission. The rivers swelled till their waters met, and turned the whole country around us into an immense lake. Happily, we had formed our little establishment on a spot rather elevated above the rest of the valley. The waters did not quite reach our tree, but surrounded us about two hundred yards off, leaving us on a sort of island in the midst of the general inundation. We were reluctantly obliged to descend from our abode. The rain entered it on all sides, and the hurricane threatened every moment to carry away the apartment and all that were in it. We set about our removal, bringing down our hammocks and bedding to the sheltered space under the roots of the trees that we had roofed for the animals. We were painfully crowded in the small space, the stores of provisions, the cooking utensils, and especially the neighborhood of the animals, and the various offensive smells, made our retreat almost insupportable. We were choked with smoke if we lighted a fire, and inundated with rain if we opened a door. For the first time since our misfortune, we sighed for the comforts of our native home, but action was necessary, and we set about endeavouring to amend our conditions. The winding staircase was very useful to us. The upper part was crowded with things we did not want, and my wife frequently worked in the lower part at one of the windows. We crowded our beasts a little more, and gave a current of air to the places they had left. I placed outside the enclosure the animals of the country, which could bear the inclemency of the season. Thus I gave a half-liberty to the buffalo and the onagra, tying their legs loosely to prevent them straying, the boughs of the tree affording them a shelter. We made as few fires as possible, as, fortunately, it was never cold, and we had no provisions that required a long process of cookery. We had milk in abundance, smoked meat, and fish, the preserved ortolans, and cassava cakes. As we sent out some of our animals in the morning, with bells round their necks, Fritz and I had to seek them and bring them in every evening, when we were invariably wet through. This induced my ingenious Elizabeth to make us a sort of blouse and hood out of old garments of the sailors, which we covered with coatings of the kuchuk, and thus obtained two capital waterproof dresses, all that the exhausted state of our gum permitted us to make. The care of our animals occupied us a great part of the morning. Then we prepared our cassava, and baked our cakes on iron plates. Though we had a glazed door to our hut, the gloominess of the weather, and the obscurity caused by the vast boughs of the tree, made night come on early. We then lighted a candle, fixed in a gourd on the table, round which we were all assembled. The good mother labored with her needle, mending the clothes. I wrote my journal, which Ernest copied, as he wrote a beautiful hand, while Fritz and Jack taught their young brother to read and write, or amused themselves with drawing the animals or plants they had been struck with. We read the lessons from the Bible in turns, and concluded the evening with devotion. We then retired to rest, content with ourselves and with our innocent and peaceful life. 
Our kind housekeeper often made us a little feast of a roast chicken, a pigeon, or a duck, and once in four or five days we had fresh butter made in the gourd churn, and the delicious honey which we ate on our cassava bread might have been a treat to European epicures. The remains of our repast was always divided amongst our domestic animals. We had four dogs, the jackal, the eagle, and the monkey, who relied on their masters, and were never neglected. But if the buffalo, the onagra, and the sow had not been able to provide for themselves, we must have killed them, for we had no food for them. We now decided that we would not expose ourselves to another rainy season in such an unsuitable habitation. Even my gentle Elizabeth got out of temper with the inconveniences, and begged we would build a better winter-house, stipulating, however, that we should return to our tree in summer. We consulted a great deal on this matter. Fritz quoted Robinson Crusoe, who had cut a dwelling out of the rock which sheltered him in the inclement season, and the idea of making our home at Tent House naturally came into my mind. It would probably be a long and difficult undertaking, but with time, patience, and perseverance we might work wonders. We resolved, as soon as the weather would allow us, to go and examine the rocks at Tent House. The last work of the winter was, at my wife's incessant request, a beetle for her flax, and some carding combs. The beetle was easily made, but the combs cost much trouble. I filed large nails till they were round and pointed. I fixed them, slightly inclined, at equal distances in a sheet of tin, and raised the edge like a box. I then poured melted lead between the nails and the edge, to fix them more firmly. I nailed this on a board and the machine was fit for use, and my wife was all anxiety to begin her manufacture. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. THE SWISS FAMILY ROBINSON by Johann David Wyss CHAPTER Twenty Nine. I cannot describe our delight when, after long and gloomy weeks, we saw at length the sky clear, and the sun, dispersing the dark clouds of winter, spread its vivifying rays over all nature. The winds were lulled, the waters subsided, and the air became mild and serene. We went out with great shouts of joy to breathe the balmy air, and gratified our eyes with the sight of the fresh verdure already springing up around us. Nature seemed in her youth again, and amidst the charms it breathed on every side, we forgot our sufferings, and like the children of Noah coming forth from the ark, we raised a hymn of thanksgiving to the giver of all good. All our plantations and seeds had prospered. The corn was springing and the trees were covered with leaves and blossoms. The air was perfumed with the odor of countless beautiful flowers, and lively with the songs and cries of hundreds of brilliant birds, all busy building their nests. This was really spring in all its glory. We began our summer occupation by cleaning and putting in order our dormitory in the tree, which the rain and the scattered leaves had greatly deranged, and in a few days we were able to inhabit it again. My wife immediately began with her flax. While my sons were leading the cattle to the pasture, I took the bundles of flax into the open air, where I constructed a sort of oven of stone, which dried it completely. We began that very evening to strip, beat, and comb it, and I drew out such handfuls of soft, fine flax ready for spinning, that my wife was overjoyed and begged me to make her a wheel that she might commence. I had formerly had a little taste for turning, and though I had now neither lathe nor any other of the tools, yet I knew how a spinning wheel and reel should be made, and by dint of application 
I succeeded in completing these two machines to her satisfaction. She began to spin with so much earnestness that she would hardly take a walk, and reluctantly left her wheel to make dinner ready. She employed Francis to reel off the thread as she spun it, and would willingly have had the elder boys to take her place when she was called off, but they rebelled at the effeminate work, except Ernest, whose indolent habits made him prefer it to more laborious occupation. In the meantime we walked over to Tent House to see the state of things, and found that winter had done more damage there than at Falcon's Nest. The storm had overthrown the tent, carried away some of the sailcloth, and injured our provisions so much that great part was good for nothing, and the rest required to be immediately dried. Fortunately our beautiful pinnace had not suffered much. It was still safe at anchor, and fit for use, but our tub-boat was entirely destroyed. Our most important loss was two barrels of gunpowder which had been left in the tent, instead of under the shelter of the rock, and which the rain had rendered wholly useless. This made us feel still more strongly the necessity of securing for the future a more suitable shelter than a canvas tent, or a roof of foliage. Still I had small hope from the gigantic plan of Fritz, or the boldness of Jack. I could not be blind to the difficulties of the undertaking. The rocks which surrounded Tent House presented an unbroken surface, like a wall without any crevice, and to all appearance of so hard a nature as to leave little hopes of success. However, it was necessary to try to contrive some sort of cave, if only for our gunpowder. I made up my mind, and selected the most perpendicular face of the rock as the place to begin our work. It was a much pleasanter situation than our tent, commanding a view of the whole bay, and the two banks of Jackal River, with its picturesque bridge. I marked out with chalk the dimension of the entrance I wished to give to the cave. Then my sons and I took our chisels, pickaxes, and heavy miners' hammers, and began boldly to hew the stone. Our first blows produced very little effect. The rock seemed impenetrable, the sun had so hardened the surface, and the sweat poured off our brows with the hard labour. Nevertheless, the efforts of my young workmen did not relax. Every evening we left our work advanced, perhaps a few inches, and every morning returned to the task with renewed ardour. At the end of five or six days, when the surface of the rock was removed, we found the stone became easier to work. It then seemed calcareous, and, finally, only a sort of hardened clay, which we could remove with spades, and we began to hope. After a few days more labour, we found we had advanced about seven feet. Fritz wheeled out the rubbish, and formed a sort of terrace with it before the opening. While I was working at the higher part, Jack, as the least, worked below. One morning, he was hammering an iron bar, which he had pointed at the end, into the rock to loosen the earth, when he suddenly cried out, "'Papa, papa, I have pierced through!' "'Not through your hand, child?' asked I. "'No, papa,' cried he, "'I have pierced through the mountain! Huzzah!' Fritz ran in at the shout, and told him he had better have said at once that he had pierced through the earth. But Jack persisted that. However his brother might laugh, he was quite sure he had felt his iron bar enter an empty space behind. I now came down from my ladder, and, moving the bar, I felt there really was a hollow into which the rubbish fell, but apparently very little below the level we were working on. I took a long pole and probed the cavity, and found that it must be of considerable size. My boys wished to have the opening enlarged, and to enter immediately, but this I strictly forbade, for as I leaned forward to examine it through the opening, a rush of mephitic air gave me a sort of vertigo. "'Come away, children!' cried I, in terror. "'The air you would breathe there is certain death!' I explained to them that, under certain circumstances, 
carbonic acid gas was frequently accumulated in caves or grottoes, rendering the air unfit for respiration, producing giddiness of the head, fainting, and eventually death. I sent them to collect some hay, which I lighted and threw into the cave. This was immediately extinguished. We repeated the experiment several times with the same result. I now saw that more active means must be resorted to. We had brought from the vessel a box of fireworks, intended for signals. I threw into the cave, by a cord, a quantity of rockets, grenades, etc., and scattered a train of gunpowder from them. To this I applied a long match, and we retired to a little distance. This succeeded well. A great explosion agitated the air. A torrent of the carbonic acid gas rushed through the opening, and was replaced by the pure air. We sent in a few more rockets, which flew around like fiery dragons, disclosing to us the vast extent of the cave. A shower of stars, which concluded our experiment, made us wish the duration had been longer. It seemed as if a crowd of winged genii, carrying each a lamp, were floating about in that enchanted cavern. When they vanished I threw in some more lighted hay, which blazed in such a lively manner that I knew all danger was over from the gas. But, for fear of deep pits or pools of water, I would not venture in without lights. I therefore dispatched Jack on his buffalo to report the discovery to his mother, and bring all the candles she had made. I purposely sent Jack on the errand, for his lively and poetic turn of mind would, I hoped, invest the grotto with such charms that his mother would even abandon her wheel to come and see it. Delighted with his commission, Jack leaped upon his buffalo, and waving his whip, galloped off with an intrepidity that made my hair stand on end. During his absence, Fritz and I enlarged the opening, to make it easy of access, removed all the rubbish, and swept a road for Mama. We had just finished when we heard the sound of wheels crossing the bridge, and the cart appeared, drawn by the cow and ass, led by Ernest. Jack rode before on his buffalo, blowing through his hand to imitate a horn, and whipping the lazy cow and ass. He rode up first, and alighted from his huge courser to help his mother out. I then lighted our candles, giving one to each, with a spare candle and flint and steel in our pockets. We took our arms, and proceeded in a solemn manner into the rock. I walked first, my sons followed and their mother came last with Francis. We had not gone on above a few steps when we stopped, struck with wonder and admiration. All was glittering around us. We were in a grotto of diamonds. From the height of the lofty vaulted roof hung innumerable crystals, which, uniting with those on the walls, formed colonnades, altars, and every sort of Gothic ornament of dazzling luster, creating a fairy palace, or an illuminated temple. When we were a little recovered from our first astonishment, we advanced with more confidence. The grotto was spacious, the floor smooth, and covered with a fine dry sand. From the appearance of these crystals I suspected their nature, and on breaking off a piece and tasting it, I found to my great joy that we were in a grotto of rock salt, which is found in large masses in the earth, usually above a bed of gypsum, and surrounded by fossils. We were charmed with this discovery, of which we could no longer have a doubt. What an advantage this was to our cattle, and to ourselves! We could now procure this precious commodity without care or labour. The acquisition was almost as valuable as this brilliant retreat was in itself, of which we were never tired of admiring the beauty. My wife was struck with our good fortune in opening the rock precisely at the right spot, but I was of opinion that this mine was of great extent, and that we could not well have missed it. Some blocks of salt were scattered on the ground, which had apparently fallen from the vaulted roof. 
I was alarmed, for such an accident might destroy one of my children, but, on examination, I found the mass above too solid to be detached spontaneously, and I concluded that the explosion of the fireworks had given this shock to the subterranean palace, which had not been entered since the creation of the world. I feared there might yet be pieces loosened. I therefore sent out my wife and younger sons. Fritz and I remained, and after carefully examining the suspected parts, we fired our guns and watched the effect. One or two pieces fell, but the rest remained firm, though we struck with long poles as high as we could reach. We were now satisfied of the security of our magnificent abode, and began to plan our arrangements for converting it into a convenient and pleasant habitation. The majority were for coming here immediately, but the wiser heads determined that, for this year, Falcon's Nest was to continue our home. There we went every night, and spent the day at Tent House, contriving and arranging our future winter dwelling. End of chapter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann David Wyss Chapter 30 The last bed of rock, before we reached the cave which Jack had pierced, was so soft and easy to work that we had little difficulty in proportioning and opening the place for our door. I hoped that, being now exposed to the heat of the sun, it would soon become as hard as the original surface. The door was that we had used for the staircase at Falcon's Nest, for as we only intended to make a temporary residence of our old tree, there was no necessity for solid fittings, and besides, I intended to close the entrance of the tree by a door of bark, more effectually to conceal it, in case savages should visit us. I then laid out the extent of the grotto at pleasure for we had ample space. We began by dividing it into two parts, that on the right of the entrance was to be our dwelling, on the left were, first, our kitchen, then the workshop and the stables, behind these were the storerooms and the cellar. In order to give light and air to our apartments, it was necessary to insert in the rock the windows we had brought from the ship, and this cost us many days of labor. The right-hand portion was subdivided into three rooms, the first our own bedroom, the middle the common sitting-room, and beyond the boys' room. As we had only three windows, we appropriated one to each bedroom, and the third to the kitchen, contenting ourselves at present with a grating in the dining-room. I constructed a sort of chimney in the kitchen, formed of four boards, and conducted the smoke thus through a hole made in the face of the rock. We made our workroom spacious enough for us to carry on all our manufactures, and it served also for our cart-house. Finally all the partition walls were put up, communicating by doors, and completing our commodious habitation. These various labors, the removal of our effects, and arranging them again, all the confusion of a change when it was necessary to be at once workmen and directors, took us a great part of summer, but the recollection of the vexations we should escape in the rainy season gave us energy. We passed nearly all our time at Tent House, the centre of our operations, and besides the gardens and plantations which surrounded it, we found many advantages which we profited by. Large turtles often came to deposit their eggs in the sand, a pleasant treat for us but we raised our desires to the possession of the turtles themselves, living, to eat when we chose. As soon as we saw one on the shore, one of my sons ran to cut off its retreat. We then hastened to assist, turned the creature on its back, passed a long cord through its shell, and tied it firmly to a post close to the water. We then placed it on its legs, when, of course, it made for the water, but could only ramble the length of its cord. 
It seemed, however, very content, and we had it in readiness when we wanted it. The lobsters, crabs, mussels, and every sort of fish which abounded on the coast plentifully supplied our table. One morning we were struck with an extraordinary spectacle. A large portion of the sea appeared in a state of ebullition, and immense flocks of marine birds were hovering over it, uttering piercing cries and plunging into the waves. From time to time the surface, on which the rising sun now shone, seemed covered with little flames, which rapidly appeared and vanished. Suddenly this extraordinary mass advanced to the bay, and we ran down, full of curiosity. We found, on our arrival, that this strange phenomenon was caused by a shoal of herrings. These shoals are so dense that they are often taken for sandbanks, are many leagues in extent, and several feet in depth. They spread themselves over the seas, carrying to barren shores the resources that nature has denied them. These brilliant, scaly creatures had now entered the bay, and my wife and children were lost in admiration of the wonderful sight. But I reminded them that when Providence sends plenty, we ought to put forth our hands to take it. I sent immediately for the necessary utensils, and organized my fishery. Fritz and Jack stood in the water, and such was the thickness of the shoal that they filled baskets, taking them up as you would water in a pail. They threw them on the sand. My wife and Ernest cut them open, cleaned them, and rubbed them with salt. I arranged them in small barrels, a layer of herrings and a layer of salt, and when the barrel was full, the ass, led by Francis, took them up to the storehouse. This labor occupied us several days, and at the end of that time we had a dozen barrels of excellent salt provision against the winter season. The refuse of this fishery, which we threw into the sea, attracted a number of sea-dogs. We killed several for the sake of the skin and the oil, which would be useful to burn in lamps, or even as an ingredient in soap, which I hoped to make at some future time. At this time I greatly improved my sledge, by placing it on two small wheels belonging to the guns of the ship, making it a light and commodious carriage but so low that we could easily place heavy weights on it. Satisfied with our labors, we returned very happy to Falcon's Nest, to spend our Sunday, and to thank God heartily for all the blessings He had given us. End of chapter The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann David Wyss Chapter 31 We went on with our labors, but slowly, as many employments diverted us from the great work. I had discovered that the crystals of salt in our grotto had a bed of gypsum for their base, from which I hoped to obtain a great advantage. I was fortunate enough to discover, behind a projecting rock, a natural passage leading to our storeroom, strewn with fragments of gypsum. I took some of it to the kitchen, and by repeated burnings calcined it, and reduced it to a fine white powder which I put into casks, and carefully preserved for use. My intention was to form our partition walls of square stones cemented with the gypsum. I employed my sons daily to collect this, till we had amassed a large quantity, using some in the first place effectually to cover our herring barrels. Four barrels were salted and covered in this way. The rest my wife smoked in a little hut of reeds and branches in the midst of which the herrings were laid on sticks, and exposed to the smoke of a fire of green moss kindled below. This dried them, and gave them the peculiar flavor so agreeable to many. We were visited by another shoal of fish a month after that of the herrings. Jack first discovered them at the mouth of Jackal River, where they had apparently come to deposit their eggs among the scattered stones. They were so large that he was sure they must be whales. I found them to be pretty large sturgeons, besides salmon, large trout, and many other fishes. Jack immediately ran for his bow and arrows, and told me he would kill them all. 
he fastened the end of a ball of string to an arrow, with a hook at the end of it, he tied the bladders of the dogfish at certain distances to the string. He then placed the ball safe on the shore, took his bow, fixed the arrow in it, and aiming at the largest salmon, shot it in the side. The fish tried to escape. I assisted him to draw the cord, and it was no easy task, for he struggled tremendously. But at length, weakened by loss of blood, we drew him to land and dispatched him. The other boys came running up to congratulate the young fisherman on his invention, and as it was to be feared that the rest, alarmed by this attack, might take their departure, we determined to abandon everything for the fishery. Fritz threw his harpoon, and landed, by means of the reel, some large salmon. Ernest took his rod, and caught trout, and I, armed like Neptune with an iron trident, succeeded in striking amongst the stones some enormous fish. The greatest difficulty was to land our booty. Fritz had struck a sturgeon at least eight feet long, which resisted our united efforts till my wife brought the buffalo, which we harnessed to the line and made ourselves masters of this immense prize. We had a great deal of labor in opening and cleaning all our fish. Some we dried and salted, some my wife boiled in oil, as they preserved the tunny. The spawn of the sturgeon, a huge mass, weighing not less than thirty pounds, I laid aside to prepare as caviar, a favorite dish in Holland and Russia. I carefully cleansed the eggs from the skin and fibers that were mixed with them, washed them thoroughly in sea-water, slightly sprinkled them with salt, then put them in a gourd pierced with small holes to let the water escape and placed weights on them to press them completely for twenty-four hours. We then removed the caviar in solid masses, like cheeses, took it to the smoking hut to dry, and in a few days had this large addition to our winter provision. My next employment was the preparation of the valuable isinglass. I took the air-bladder and sounds of the fish, cut them in strips, twisted them in rolls, and dried them in the sun. This is all that is necessary to prepare this excellent glue. It becomes very hard, and when wanted for use, is cut up in small pieces and dissolved over a slow fire. The glue was so white and transparent that I hoped to make window panes from it instead of glass. After this work was finished, we began to plan a boat to replace our tub raft. I wished to try to make one of bark, as the savage nations do, and I proposed to make an expedition in search of a tree for our purpose. All those in our own neighborhood were too precious to destroy, some for their fruits, others for their shade. We resolved to search at a distance for trees fit for our purpose, taking in our road a survey of our plantations and fields. Our garden at Tent House produced abundantly continual successions of vegetables in that virgin soil, and in a climate which recognized no change of season. The peas, beans, lentils, and lettuces were flourishing, and only required water, and our channels from the river brought this plentifully to us. We had delicious cucumbers and melons, the maize was already a foot high, the sugar canes were prospering, and the pineapples on the high ground promised us a rich treat. We hoped our distant plantations were going on as well and all set out one fine morning to Falcon's Nest, to examine the state of things there. We found my wife's cornfields were luxuriant in appearance, and for the most part ready for cutting. There were barley, wheat, oats, beans, millet, and lentils. We cut such of these as were ready, sufficient to give us seeds for another year. The richest crop was the maize, which suited the soil but there were a quantity of gatherers more eager to taste these new productions than we were. There were birds of every kind, from the bustard to the quail, and from the various establishments they had formed round, it might be presumed they would not leave much for us. After our first shock at the sight of these robbers, we used some measures to lessen the number of them. 
Fritz unhooded his eagle, and pointed out the dispersing bustards. The well-trained bird immediately soared, and pounced on a superb bustard, and laid it at the feet of its master. The jackal, too, who was a capital pointer, brought to his master about a dozen little fat quails, which furnished us with an excellent repast, to which my wife added a liquor of her own invention, made of the green maize, crushed in water, and mingled with the juice of the sugar-cane, a most agreeable beverage, white as milk, sweet and refreshing. We found the bustard, which the eagle had struck down, but slightly wounded. We washed his hurts with a balsam made of wine, butter, and water, and tied him by the leg in the poultry-yard, as a companion to our tame bustard. We passed the remainder of the day at Falcon's Nest, putting our summer abode into order, and thrashing out our grain, to save the precious seed for another year. The turkey-wheat was laid by in sheaves, till we should have time to thrash and winnow it. And then I told Fritz that it would be necessary to put the hand-mill in order that we had brought from the wreck. Fritz thought we could build a mill ourselves on the river, but this bold scheme was, at present, impracticable. The next day we set out on an excursion in the neighborhood. My wife wished to establish colonies of our animals at some distance from Falcon's Nest, at a convenient spot, where they would be secure and might find subsistence. We selected from her poultry-yard twelve young fowls. I took four young pigs, two couple of sheep, and two goats. These animals were placed in the cart, in which we had previously placed our provisions of every kind, and the tools and utensils we might need not forgetting the rope-ladder and the portable tent. We then harnessed the buffalo, the cow, and the ass, and departed on our tour. Fritz rode before on Lightfoot, to reconnoitre the ground, that we might not plunge into any difficulties, as, this time, we went in a new direction, exactly in the midst between the rocks and the shore, that we might get acquainted with the whole of the country that stretched to Cape Disappointment. We had the usual difficulty, at first, in getting through the high grass, and the underwood embarrassed our road, till we were compelled to use the axe frequently. I made some trifling discoveries that were useful while engaged in this labour. Amongst others, some roots of trees curved like saddles, and yokes for beasts of draught. I cut away several of these, and placed them on the cart. When we had nearly passed the wood, we were struck with the singular appearance of a little thicket of low bushes, apparently covered with snow. Francis clapped his hands with joy, and begged to get out of the cart that he might make some snowballs. Fritz galloped forward, and returned, bringing me a branch loaded with this beautiful white down, which, to my great joy, I recognized to be cotton. It was a discovery of inestimable value to us and my wife began immediately to enumerate all the advantages we should derive from it, when I should have constructed for her the machines for spinning and weaving the cotton. We soon gathered as much as filled three bags, intending afterwards to collect the seeds of this marvellous plant, to sow in the neighbourhood of Tent House. After crossing the plain of the cotton-trees, we reached the summit of a hill, from which the eye rested on a terrestrial paradise. Trees of every sort covered the sides of the hill, and a murmuring stream crossed the plain, adding to its beauty and fertility. The wood we had just crossed formed a shelter against the north winds, and the rich pasture offered food for our cattle. We decided at once that this should be the site of our farm. We erected our tent, made a fireplace, and set about cooking our dinner. While this was going on, Fritz and I sought a convenient spot for our structure, and we met with a group of beautiful trees, at such a distance one from another, as to form natural pillars for our dwelling. We carried all our tools here, but as the day was far advanced, we delayed commencing our work till next day. We returned to the tent, and found my wife and her boys picking cotton with which they had made some very comfortable beds, and we slept peacefully under our canvas roof. End of chapter. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann David Wyss Chapter 32 The trees which I had chosen for my farmhouse were about a foot in diameter in the trunk. They formed a long square, the long side facing the sea. The dimensions of the whole were about twenty-four feet by sixteen. I cut deep mortices in the trees, about ten feet distant from the ground, and again ten feet higher, to form a second story. I then placed in them strong poles. This was the skeleton of my house, solid, if not elegant. I placed over this a rude roof of bark, cut in squares, and placed sloping, that the rain might run off. We fastened these with a thorn of the acacia, as our nails were too precious to be lavished. While procuring the bark, we made many discoveries. The first was that of two remarkable trees, the Pistacia terebinthus and the Pistacia atlantica. The next, the thorny acacia, from which we got the substitute for nails. The instinct of my goats led us also to find out, among the pieces of bark, that of the cinnamon, not perhaps equal to that of Ceylon, but very fragrant and agreeable. But this was of little value compared to the turpentine and mastic I hoped to procure from the pistachios, to compose a sort of pitch to complete our intended boat. We continued our work at the house, which occupied us several days. We formed the walls of thin laths, interwoven with long, pliant reeds for about six feet from the ground. The rest was merely a sort of light trellis work, to admit light and air. The door opened on the front to the sea. The interior consisted simply of a series of compartments, proportioned to the guests they were to contain. One small apartment was for ourselves when we chose to visit our colony. On the upper story was a sort of hayloft for the fodder. We projected, plastering the walls with clay, but these finishing touches we deferred to a future time, contented that we had provided a shelter for our cattle and fowls. To accustom them to come to this shelter of themselves, we took care to fill their racks with the food they liked best, mingled with salt, and this we proposed to renew at intervals, till the habit of coming to their houses was fixed. We all labored ardently, but the work proceeded slowly, from our inexperience and the provisions we had brought were nearly exhausted. I did not wish to return to Falcon's Nest till I had completed my new establishment, and therefore determined to send Fritz and Jack to look after the animals at home, and bring back a fresh stock of provisions. Our two young couriers set out each on his favorite steed, Fritz leading the ass to bring back the load, and Jack urging the indolent animal forward with his whip. During their absence, Ernest and I made a little excursion, to add to our provision. If we could meet with them, some potatoes and coconuts. We ascended the stream for some time, which led us to a large marsh, beyond which we discovered a lake abounding with waterfowl. This lake was surrounded by tall, thick grass, with ears of a grain which I found to be a very good, though small, sort of rice. As to the lake itself, it is only a Swiss, accustomed from his infancy to look on such smooth, tranquil waters, that can comprehend the happiness we felt on looking upon this. We fancied we were once more in Switzerland, our own dear land, but the majestic trees and luxuriant vegetation soon reminded us we were no longer in Europe, and that the ocean separated us from our native home. In the meantime, Ernest had brought down several birds, with a skill and success that surprised me. A little after, we saw Nips leap off the back of his usual palfrey, Flora, and making his way through the rich grass, collect and carry rapidly to his mouth something that seemed particularly to please his palate. We followed him, and to our great comfort, were able to refresh ourselves with that delicious strawberry called in Europe the chili or pineapple strawberry. We ate plentifully of this fruit, 
which was of enormous size. Ernest especially enjoyed them, but did not forget the absent. He filled Nip's little pannier with them, and I covered them with large leaves, which I fastened down with reeds, lest he should take a fancy to help himself as we went home. I took also a specimen of rice, for the inspection of our good housekeeper, who would, I knew, rejoice in such an acquisition. We proceeded round the lake, which presented a different scene on every side. This was one of the most lovely and fertile parts we had yet seen of this country. Birds of all kinds abounded, but we were particularly struck with a pair of black swans sailing majestically on the water. Their plumage was perfectly black and glossy, except the extremity of the wings, which was white. Ernest would have tried his skill again, but I forbade him to disturb the profound tranquillity of this charming region. But Flora, who probably had not the same taste for the beauties of nature that I had, suddenly darted forward like an arrow, pounced upon a creature that was swimming quietly at the edge of the water, and brought it to us. It was a most curious animal. It resembled an otter in form, but was web-footed, had an erect bushy tail like the squirrel, small head, eyes and ears almost invisible. A long, flat bill like that of a duck completed its strange appearance. We were completely puzzled. Even Ernest the naturalist could not give its name. I boldly gave it the name of the beast with the bill. I told Ernest to take it, as I wished to stuff and preserve it. "'It will be,' said the little philosopher, "'the first natural object for our museum.' exactly replied i and when the establishment is fully arranged we will appoint you curator but thinking my wife would grow uneasy at our protracted absence we returned by a direct road to the tent our two messengers arrived about the same time and we all sat down together to a cheerful repast every one related his feats ernest dwelt on his discoveries and was very pompous in its descriptions and I was obliged to promise to take Fritz another time. I learnt with pleasure that all was going on well at Falcon's Nest, and that the boys had had the forethought to leave the animals with provisions for ten days. This enabled me to complete my farmhouse. We remained four days longer, in which time I finished the interior, and my wife arranged in our own apartment the cotton mattresses to be ready for our visits, and put into the houses the fodder and grain for their respective tenants. We then loaded our cart and began our march. The animals wished to follow us, but Fritz, on Lightfoot, covered our retreat, and kept them at the farm till we were out of sight. We did not proceed directly, but went towards the wood of monkeys. These mischievous creatures assaulted us with showers of the fir apples, but a few shots dispersed our assailants. Fritz collected some of these new fruits they had flung at us, and I recognized them as those of the stone pine, the kernel of which is good to eat and produces an excellent oil. We gathered a bag of these, and continued our journey, till we reached the neighborhood of Cape Disappointment. There we ascended a little hill, from the summit of which we looked upon rich plains, rivers, and woods clothed with verdure and brilliant flowers and gay birds that fluttered among the bushes. "'Here, my children,' cried I, "'here we will build our summer-house. This is truly Arcadia.' Here we placed our tent, and immediately began to erect a new building, formed in the same manner as the farmhouse, but now executed more quickly. We raised the roof in the middle, and made four sloped sides. The interior was divided into eating and sleeping apartments, stables, and a storeroom for provisions. The whole was completed and provisioned in ten days, and we now had another mansion for ourselves, and a shelter for new colonies of animals. This new erection received the name of Prospect Hill, to gratify Ernest, who thought it had an English appearance. However, the end for which our expedition was planned was not yet fulfilled. I had not yet met with a tree likely to suit me for a boat. We returned then to inspect the trees, and I fixed on a sort of oak, the bark of which was closer than that of the European oak. 
resembling more like that of the cork tree. The trunk was at least five feet in diameter, and I fancied its coating, if I could obtain it whole, would perfectly answer my purpose. I traced a circle at the foot, and with a small saw cut the bark entirely through. Fritz, by means of the rope-ladder we had brought with us, and attached to the lower branches of the tree, ascended, and cut a similar circle eighteen feet above mine. We then cut out, perpendicularly, a slip the whole length, and, removing it, we had room to insert the necessary tools, and, with wedges, we finally succeeded in loosening the hole. The first part was easy enough but there was greater difficulty as we advanced. We sustained it as we proceeded with ropes, and then gently let it down on the grass. I immediately began to form my boat, while the bark was fresh and flexible. My sons, in their impatience, thought it would do very well if we nailed a board at each end of the roll, but this would have been merely a heavy trough, inelegant and unserviceable. I wished to have one that would look well by the side of the pinnace, and this idea at once rendered my boys patient and obedient. We began by cutting out at each end of the roll of bark a triangular piece of about five feet long. Then, placing the sloping parts one over the other, I united them with pegs and strong glue, and thus finished the ends of my boat in a pointed form. This operation having widened it too much in the middle, we passed strong ropes round it, and drew it into the form we required. We then exposed it to the sun, which dried and fixed it in the proper shape. As many things were necessary to complete my work, I sent Fritz and Jack to Tent House for the sledge, to convey it there, that we might finish it more conveniently. I had the good fortune to meet with some very hard, crooked wood, the natural curve of which would be admirably suitable for supporting the sides of the boat. We found also a resinous tree, which distilled a sort of pitch, easy to manage, and which soon hardened in the sun. My wife and Francis collected sufficient of it for my work. It was almost night when our two messengers returned. We had only time to sup and retire to our rest. We were all early at work next morning. We loaded the sledge, placing on it the canoe, the wood for the sides, the pitch, and some young trees which I had transplanted for our plantation at Tent House, and which we put into the boat. But before we set out, I wished to erect a sort of fortification at the pass of the rock for the double purpose of securing us against the attacks of wild beasts, or of savages, and for keeping enclosed, in the savannah beyond the rocks, some young pigs that we wished to multiply there, out of the way of our fields and plantations. As we crossed the sugar-cane plantation, I saw some bamboos larger than any I had ever met with, and we cut down one for a mast to our canoe. We now had the river to our left, and the chain of rocks to our right, which here approached the river, leaving only a narrow pass. At the narrowest part of this we raised a rampart before a deep ditch, which could only be crossed by a drawbridge we placed there. Beyond the bridge we put a narrow gate of woven bamboos, to enable us to enter the country beyond when we wished. We planted the side of the rampart with dwarf palms, India fig, and other thorny shrubs, making a winding path through the plantation, and digging in the midst a hidden pitfall known to ourselves by four low posts, intended to support a plank bridge when we wished to cross it. After this was completed, we built a little chalet of bark in that part of the plantation that faced the stream, and gave it the name of the Hermitage intending it for a resting place. After several days of hard labor, we returned to Prospect Hill, and took a little relaxation. The only work we did was to prepare the mast, and lay it on the sledge with the rest. The next morning we returned to Tent House, where we immediately set to work on our canoe with such diligence that it was soon completed. It was solid and elegant, 
lined through with wood, and furnished with a keel. We provided it with brass rings for the oars, and stays for the mast. Instead of ballast, I laid at the bottom a layer of stones covered with clay, and over this a flooring of boards. The benches for the rowers were laid across, and in the midst the bamboo mast rose majestically with a triangular sail. Behind I fixed the rudder, worked by a tiller, and I could now boast of having built a capital canoe. Our fleet was now in good condition. For distant excursions we could take the pinnace, but the canoe would be invaluable for the coasting service. Our cow had, in the meantime, given us a young male calf, which I undertook to train for service, as I had done the buffalo, beginning by piercing its nostrils, and the calf promised to be docile and useful, and, as each of the other boys had his favorite animal to ride, I bestowed the bull on Francis, and entrusted him with its education, to encourage him to habits of boldness and activity. He was delighted with his new charger, and chose to give him the name of Valiant. We had still two months before the rainy season, and this time we devoted to completing the comforts of our grotto. We made all the partitions of wood, except those which divided us from the stables, which we built of stone, to exclude any smell from the animals. We soon acquired skill in our works. We had a plentiful supply of beams and planks from the ship, and by practice we became very good plasterers. We covered the floors with a sort of well-beaten mud, smoothed it, and it dried perfectly hard. We then contrived a sort of felt carpet. We first covered the floor with sailcloth. We spread over this wool and goat's hair mixed, and poured over it isinglass dissolved, rolling up the carpet and beating it well. When this was dry, we repeated the process, and in the end had a felt carpet. We made one of these for each room, to guard against any damp that we might be subject to in the rainy season. The privations we had suffered the preceding winter increased the enjoyment of our present comforts. The rainy season came on. We had now a warm, well-lighted, convenient habitation, and abundance of excellent provision for ourselves and our cattle. In the morning we could attend to their wants without trouble for the rainwater, carefully collected in clean vessels, prevented the necessity of going to the river. We then assembled in the dining-room to prayers. After that we went to our workroom. My wife took her wheel, or her loom, which was a rude construction of mine, but in which she had contrived to weave some useful cloth of wool and cotton, and also some linen, which she had made up for us. Everybody worked. The workshop was never empty. I contrived, with the wheel of a gun, to arrange a sort of lathe, by means of which I and my sons produced some neat furniture and utensils. Ernest surprised us all in this art, and made some elegant little things for his mother. After dinner, our evening occupations commenced. Our room was lighted up brilliantly. We did not spare our candles, which were so easily procured, and we enjoyed the reflection in the elegant crystals above us. We had partitioned off a little chapel in one corner of the grotto, which we had left untouched, and nothing could be more magnificent than this chapel lighted up, with its colonnades, portico, and altars. We had divine service here every Sunday. I had erected a sort of pulpit, from which I delivered a short sermon to my congregation, which I endeavoured to render as simple and as instructive as possible. Jack and Francis had a natural taste for music. I made them flagellets of reeds, on which they acquired considerable skill. They accompanied their mother, who had a very good voice, and this music in our lofty grotto had a charming effect. We thus made great steps towards civilization, and, though condemned, perhaps, to pass our lives alone on this unknown shore, we might yet be happy. We were placed in the midst of abundance. We were active, industrious, and content, blessed with health, and united by affection. Our minds seemed to enlarge and improve every day. We saw around us on every side traces of the divine wisdom and beneficence, and our hearts overflowed with love and veneration for that almighty hand which had so miraculously saved, 
and continued to protect us. I humbly trusted in him, either to restore us to the world, or send some beings to join us in this beloved island, where for two years we had seen no trace of man. To him we committed our fate. We were happy and tranquil, looking with resignation to the future. End of the first part of the journal. Postscript by the editor. It is necessary to explain how this first part of the journal of the Swiss pastor came into my hands. Three or four years after the family had been cast on this desert coast, where, as we see, they lived a happy and contented life, an English transport was driven by a storm upon the same shore. This vessel was the Adventurer, Captain Johnson, and was returning from New Zealand to the eastern coast of North America, by Otaheite, to fetch a cargo of furs for China, and then to proceed from Canton to England. A violent storm, which lasted several days, drove them out of their course. For many days they wandered in unknown seas, and the ship was so injured by the storm that the captain looked out for some port to repair it. They discovered a rocky coast, and as the violence of the wind was lulled, ventured to approach the shore. At a short distance they anchored, and sent a boat to examine the coast. Lieutenant Bell, who went with the boat, knew a little German. They were some time before they could venture to land among the rocks which guarded the island, but, turning the promontory, they saw Safety Bay, and, entering it, were astonished to see a handsome pinnace and a boat at anchor, near the strand a tent, and in the rock doors and windows, like those of a European house. They landed, and saw a middle-aged man coming to meet them, clothed in European fashion, and well armed. After a friendly salutation, they first spoke in German, and then in English. This was the good father. The family were at Falcon's Nest, where they were spending the summer. He had seen the vessel in the morning through his telescope, but, unwilling to alarm, or to encourage hopes that might be vain, he had not spoken of it, but come alone towards the coast. After much friendly conference, the party was regaled with all hospitality at Tent House. The good Swiss gave the lieutenant this first part of his journal for the perusal of Captain Johnson, and, after an hour's conversation, they separated, hoping to have a pleasant meeting next day. But heaven decreed it otherwise. During the night another fearful storm arose. The adventurer lost its anchor, and was driven out to sea and after several days of anxiety and danger, found itself so far from the island, and so much shattered, that all thoughts of returning were given up for that time, and Captain Johnson reluctantly relinquished the hope of rescuing the interesting family. Thus it happened that the first part of this journal was brought to England, and from thence sent to me, a friend of the family, in Switzerland, accompanied by a letter from the captain, declaring, that he could have no rest until he found, and became acquainted with, this happy family, that he would search for the island in his future voyages, and either bring away the family, or, if they preferred to remain, he would send out from England some colonists, and everything that might be necessary to promote their comfort. A rough map of the island is added to the journal, executed by Fritz, the eldest son. This ends chapter 32. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann David Wyss. Chapter 33. I left the reader at the moment in which I had placed the first part of my journal in the hands of Lieutenant Bell, to deliver to Captain Johnson of the English vessel, the Adventurer, expecting him to return the next day with Lieutenant Bell. We separated in this hope, and I thought it necessary to inform my family of this expected visit, which might decide their future lot. My wife and elder sons might wish to seize this only occasion that might occur to revisit their native country to quit their beloved island, 
which would doubtless cost them much sorrow at the last moment, but was necessary to their future comfort. I could not help feeling distressed at the prospect of my dear children's solitary old age, and I determined, if they did not wish to return with Captain Johnson, to request him to send some colonists out to people our island. It will be remembered that I had left home alone and at an early hour, having perceived a vessel from the top of our tree with my telescope. I had set out without breakfast, without giving my sons their tasks, or making any arrangements for the labours of the day. My conference with Lieutenant Bell had been long. It was now past noon, and knowing how prompt my wife was to alarm herself, I was surprised that I did not meet her, nor any of my sons. I began to be uneasy, and on my arrival I hastily mounted the tree, and found my faithful partner extended on her bed, surrounded by her four sons, and apparently in great pain. I demanded with a cry of grief what had happened. All wished to speak at once, and it was with some difficulty I learned that my dear wife, in descending the staircase, had been seized with a giddiness in her head, and had fallen down and injured herself so much that she was unable to rise without assistance. She was now enduring great pain in her right leg and in her left foot. "'Ernest and I,' added Fritz, "'carried her without delay to her bed, though not without difficulty, for the staircase is so narrow. But she continued to get worse, and we did not know what to do,' Jack said. "'I have rubbed her foot continually, but it swells more and more, as well as her leg, which I dare not touch, it hurts her so much,' and said Ernest. "'I remember, father, that of the chest that we brought from the ship there is one unopened, which is marked medicines. May it not contain something that will relieve mamma? "'Perhaps it may, my son. You did well to remember it. We will go to Tent House for it. Fritz, you shall accompany me to assist in bringing it.' I wished to be alone with Fritz, to consult him about the English vessel, and was glad of this opportunity. Before I left my wife, I intended to examine her leg and foot, which were exceedingly painful. When I was preparing to enter the church, I had studied medicine and practical surgery, in order to be able to administer to the bodily afflictions of my poor parishioners, as well as to their spiritual sorrows. I knew how to bleed, and could replace the dislocated limb. I had often made cures, but since my arrival at the island, I had neglected my medical studies, which happily had not been needed. I hoped now, however, to recall as much of my knowledge as would be sufficient to cure my poor wife. I examined her foot first, which I found to be violently sprained. She begged me then to look at her leg, and what was my distress when I saw it was fractured above the ankle! However, the fracture appeared simple, without splinters, and easy to cure. I sent Fritz without delay to procure me two pieces of the bark of a tree, between which I placed the leg, after having, with the assistance of my son, stretched it till the two pieces of broken bone united. I then bound it with bandages of linen, and tied the pieces of bark round the leg, so that it might not be moved. I bound the sprained foot very tightly, till I could procure the balsam which I expected to find in the chest. I felt assured that the giddiness of the head which had caused her fall proceeded from some existing cause, which I suspected from the pulse and the complexion, must be a fullness of blood, and it appeared to be necessary to take away some ounces, which I persuaded her to allow me to do, when I should have brought my medicine chest and instruments from Tent House. I left her with many charges to the care of my three younger sons, and proceeded to Tent House with Fritz, to whom I now related my morning adventure and consulted him how we should mention it to its mother. Fritz was astonished. I saw how his mind was employed. He looked round on our fields and plantations, increasing and prospering. "'We must not tell her, father,' said he. "'I will be at Tent House early in the morning. You must give me some commission to execute. I will await the arrival of the captain, and tell him that my dear mother is ill, and that he may return as he came.' "'You speak rashly, Fritz,' answered I. "'I have told you that this ship has suffered much from the storm, and needs repairs. 
Have you not often read the golden rule of our Divine Master? Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Our duty is to receive the captain into our island, and to assist him in repairing and refitting his vessel. And he will find, said he, we know something of that kind of work. Did you show him our beautiful pinnace and canoe? But can such a large vessel enter our bay of safety? No, replied I. I fear there will not be sufficient water. But we will show the captain the large bay at the other end of the island, formed by Cape Disappointment. He will find there a beautiful harbour. And he and his officers may live at the farm, and we can go over every day to assist in repairing their vessel," continued Fritz. "'Very well,' said I. "'And when it is finished, he will, in return, give us a place in it, to return to Europe.' "'To return to Europe, father!' cried he. "'To leave our beautiful winter dwelling, tent house, and our charming summer residence, Falcon's Nest, our dear good animals, our crystals of salt, our farms, so much that is our own and which nobody covets to return into europe to poverty to war to those wicked soldiers who have banished us we want nothing dear father can you consent to leave our beloved island you are right my dear son said i would to god we might always remain here happily together but we are of different ages and by the law of nature we must one day be separated Consider, my dear son, if you should survive your brothers, how cheerless it would be to live quite alone on this desert island, without any one to close your eyes. But let us look at these trees. I see they are tamarind trees. Their fruit contains a pulp which is very useful in medicine, and which will suit your mother, I think, as well as the juice of the orange or lemon. We shall find some of the latter at our plantation near Tent House, but in the meantime— do you climb the tamarind tree and gather some of those pods which resemble those of beans? Fill one side of the bag with them, and the other we will reserve for the oranges and lemons. Not to lose any time, I will go on to Tent House to seek for the two chests, and you can follow me. Fritz was up the tamarind tree in a moment. I crossed Family Bridge, and soon reached the grotto. I lighted a candle, which I always kept ready, entered the magazine and found the two chests labelled. They were neither large nor heavy, and having tied cords round them for the convenience of carrying them, I proceeded to visit the orange and lemon trees, where I found the fruit sufficiently ripe for lemonade. Fritz came to meet me, with a good supply of tamarinds. We filled the other end of his sack with oranges and lemons. He threw it over his shoulder, and, neither of us being overloaded, we pursued our way homewards very quickly notwithstanding the heat, which was excessively oppressive, though the sun was hidden under the thick clouds, which entirely concealed the sea from us. Nothing was to be seen but the waves breaking against the rocks. Fritz expressed his fears that a storm was coming on, which might prove fatal to the vessel, and wished to take out the pinnace and endeavour to assist Captain Johnson. Delighted as I felt with his fearless humanity, I could not consent. I reminded him of the situation of his mother. "'Forgive me, dear father,' said he. "'I had forgotten everything but the poor vessel. But the captain may do as we did, leave his ship between the rocks, and come with all in the vessel to establish themselves here. We will give them up a corner of our islands, and if there should be any ladies amongst them, how pleasant it would be for Mama to have a friend!' The rain fell now in torrents, and we proceeded with great difficulty. After crossing the bridge, we saw at a distance a very extraordinary figure approaching us. We could not ascertain what species of animal it was. It appeared taller than any of the monkeys we had seen, and much larger, of a black or brown colour. We could not distinguish the head, but it seemed to have two thick and movable horns before it. We had fortunately taken no gun with us, or Fritz would certainly have fired at the singular animal, but as it rapidly approached us we soon recognized the step, and the cry of pleasure which hailed us. "'It is Jack!' we exclaimed, and in fact it was he, who was hurrying to meet us with my large cloak and waterproof kuchuk boots. 
I had neglected to take them, and my dear little fellow had volunteered to bring them to Tent House. To protect himself on the way he had put the cloak on, covering his head with a hood, and my boots being too large for him, he had put one on each arm, which he held up to secure the hood. Conceive what a singular figure he made! Notwithstanding our uneasiness and our wretched condition, for we were wet to the skin, we could not but laugh heartily at him. I would not consent to use the coverings he had brought. Neither Fritz nor I could be worse for the distance we had to go, and Jack was younger and more delicate. I obliged him, therefore, to retain his curious protection, and asked how he had left his mother. "'Very uneasy,' said he, "'about you, else I think she must be much better, for her cheeks are very red, and her eyes very bright, and she talks incessantly. She would have come herself to seek you, but could not rise, and when I told her I would come, she bid me be very quick, and when I was coming downstairs, I heard her call me back for fear of the rain and the thunder. I would not hear her, but ran as fast as I could, hoping to reach Tent House. Why did you come back so soon? To spare you half your journey, my brave little man, said I, hastening on, for Jack's account of his mother made me uneasy. I perceive she must be labouring under fever, and the blood ascending to her head. My children followed me, and we soon reached the foot of our castle in the air. End of chapter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann David Wyss. Chapter 34. We entered our apartment literally as if we had come out of the sea, and I found my poor Elizabeth much agitated. "'Heaven be praised,' said she. "'But where is Jack, that rash little fellow?' "'Here I am, Mama," said he, "'as dry as when I left you. I have left my dress below, that I might not terrify you, for if Mr. Fritz had had his gun, I might have been shot as a rhinoceros, and not been here to tell you my story.' The good mother then turned her thoughts on Fritz and me and would not suffer us to come near her till we had changed our drenched garments. To oblige her, we retired to a little closet I had contrived between two thick branches at the top of the staircase, which was used to contain our chests of linen, our dresses, and our provisions. Our dress was soon changed, we hung up the wet garments, and I returned to my companion, who was suffering from her foot, but still more from a frightful headache. She had a burning fever. I concluded that bleeding was urgently needed, but commenced by assuaging her thirst with some lemonade. I then opened my box of surgical instruments, and approaching the opening to the east, which served us for a window, and which we could close by means of a curtain, that was now entirely raised to give air to our dear invalid, and to amuse my children, who were watching the storm. The mighty waves that broke against the rocks, the vivid lightning bursting through the castles of murky clouds, the majestic and incessant rolling of the thunder, formed one of those enchanting spectacles to which they had been from infancy accustomed. As in the Swiss mountains we are liable to frightful storms, to which it is necessary to familiarize oneself, as one cannot avoid them, I had accustomed my wife and children, by my own example, to behold not only without fear, but even with admiration, these great shocks of the elements, these convulsions of nature. I had opened the chest, and my children had directed their attention to the instruments it contained. The first were a little rusty, and I handed them to Ernest, who, after examining them, placed them on a table inside the window. I was searching for a lancet, in good condition, when a clap of thunder such as I had never heard in my life terrified us all so much that we nearly fell down. This burst of thunder had not been preceded by any lightning, but was accompanied by two immense forked columns of fire, which seemed to stretch from the sky to our very feet. We all cried out, even my poor wife, but the silence of terror succeeded, and seemed to be the silence of death. 
I flew to the bedside, and found my dear patient in a state of total insensibility. I was convinced that she was dead, and I was dumb with despair. I was roused from my stupor by the voice of my children. I then remembered that I had not lost all, there still remained duties to fulfill, and affection to console me. "'My children!' cried I, extending my arms to them. "'Come and comfort your unfortunate father. Come and lament with him the best of wives and mothers!' Terrified at the appearance of their mother, they surrounded her bed, calling on her in piercing accents. At that moment I saw my little Francis was missing, and my grief was augmented by the fear that he had been killed by the lightning. I hastily turned to the window, expecting to find my child dead, and our dwelling in flames. Fortunately, all was safe, but in my distraction I scarcely thanked God for His mercy, at the very moment even when He graciously restored to me my lost treasures. Francis, frightened by the storm, had hidden himself in his mother's bed, and fallen asleep. Awaked by the thunder, he had dared not to move, fearing it announced the arrival of the savages. But at last the cries of his brothers roused him, and raising his pretty fair head, supposing his mother sleeping, he flung his arms around her neck, saying, "'Wake, Mama! We are all here! Papa, my brothers, and the storm, too, which is very beautiful!' but it frightens me. Open your eyes, Mama. Look at the bright lightning, and kiss your little Francis." Either his sweet voice, or the cries of her elder children, restored her faculties. She gradually recovered and called me to her. The excess of my joy threatened to be almost as fatal as my grief. With difficulty I controlled my own feelings and those of my boys and after I had sent them from the bed, I ascertained that she was not only really living, but much better. The pulse was calm, and the fever had subsided, leaving only a weakness that was by no means alarming. I relinquished joyfully the intention of bleeding her, the necessity of which I had trembled to contemplate, and contented myself with employing the boys to prepare a cooling mixture, composed of the juice of the lemon, of barley and tamarinds, which they completed to the great satisfaction of their mother. I then ordered Fritz to descend to the yard to kill a fowl, pluck, and boil it, to make broth, a wholesome and light nourishment for our dear invalid. I told one of his brothers to assist him, and Jack and Francis, frequently employed under their mother, were ready in a moment. Ernest alone remained quietly on his seat which I attributed to his usual indolence, and tried to make him ashamed of it. "'Ernest,' said I, "'you are not very anxious to oblige your mother. You sit as if the thunderbolt had struck you.' "'It has indeed rendered me unfit to be of any service to my good mother,' said he quietly, and drawing his right hand from under his waistcoat, he showed it to me, most frightfully black and burnt. "'This dear child!' who must have suffered very much, had never uttered a complaint, for fear of alarming his mother, and even now he made a sign to me to be silent, lest she should hear and discover the truth. She soon, however, fell into a sleep which enabled me to attend to poor Ernest, and to question him about the accident. I learned that a long and pointed steel instrument, which he was examining near the large window, stooping over it to see it better, had attracted the lightning, which, falling partly on the hand to which he held it, had caused the misfortune. There were traces on his arm of the electric fire, and his hair was burnt on one side. By what miracle the electric fluid had been diverted, and how we, dwelling in a tree, had been preserved from a sudden and general conflagration, I knew not. My son assured me he had seen the fire run along the instrument he held and from thence fall perpendicularly to the earth, where it seemed to burst with a second explosion. I was impatient to examine this phenomenon, and to see if any other traces were left, except those on the hand of my son, which it was necessary, in the first place, to attend to. I remembered frequently to have applied with success in Burns the most simple and easy of remedies, 
which everybody can command. This is to bathe the hand affected in cold water, taking care to renew it every eight or ten minutes. I placed Ernest between two tubs of cold water, and exhorting him to patience and perseverance, I left him to bathe his hand, and approached the opening, to try and discover what had preserved us, by averting the direction of the lightning, which one might have expected would have killed my son, and destroyed our dwelling. I saw only some light traces on the table, but, on looking more attentively, I found that the greater part of the surgical instruments which Ernest had placed upon it were either melted or much damaged. In examining them separately, I remarked one much longer than the rest, which projected beyond the edge of the table, and was much marked by the fire. I could not easily take it up, it had adhered somewhat in melting and in endeavouring to disengage it, I saw that the point, which was beyond the opening, touched a thick wire which seemed to be suspended from the roof of our tent. All was now explained to me, except that I could in no way account for this wire, placed expressly to serve as a conductor for the lightning. It seemed to be the work of magic. The evening was too far advanced for me to distinguish how it was fastened, and what fixed it below. Therefore, enjoining Ernest to call loudly if he needed me, I hastened down. I saw my three cooks very busy as I passed through, preparing the broth for their mother. They assured me it would be excellent. Fritz boasted that he had killed the fowl with all speed, Jack that he had plucked it without tearing it much, and Francis that he had lighted and kept up the fire. They had nothing to employ them just then, and I took them with me to have some one to talk to on the phenomenon of the lightning. Below the window I found a large packet of iron wire, which I had brought from Tent House some days before, intending on some leisure day to make a sort of grating before our poultry-yard. By what chance was it here, and hooked by one end to the roof of our house? Some time before I had replaced our cloth canopy by a sort of roof covered with bark, nailed upon laths. The cloth still enclosed the sides in front. All was so inflammable that, but for the providential conductor, we might have been in flames in an instant. I thanked God for our preservation, and little Francis, seeing me so happy, said, "'Is it quite true, papa, that this wire has preserved us?' "'Yes, it is true, my darling, and I wish to know what good genius has placed it there, that I may be thankful,' said I. "'Ah, father,' said my little fellow, "'embrace me, but do not thank me, for I did not know that I was doing good.' Astonished at this information, I requested my boy to tell me why and how he had fixed the wire. "'I wanted to reach some figs,' said he, "'when you and Fritz were at Tent House, and Jack and Ernest were nursing Mamma. I wished to do some good for her. I thought she would like some of our sweet figs, but there were none in my reach, and I had no stick long enough to beat them down. I went below, and found that great roll of wire. I tried to break a piece off, but could not, and I then determined to carry the whole up to our dwelling, and to bend one end into a hook, by which I might catch some of the branches, and bring them near me to gather the figs. I was very successful at first, and secured one or two figs. I had my packet of wire on the table by the window, and stood near it myself. I thought I could reach a branch that hung over our roof, loaded with fruit. I leaned forward, and extended my hook to the branch. I felt I had secured it, and joyfully began to pull. You know, Papa, they bend and don't break. But it remained immovable, as well as my hook which was held by one of the laths in the roof. I pulled with all my strength, and in my efforts I struck my foot against the roll of wire, which fell down to the ground without detaching the hook. You may judge how firm it is, for it is no trifling leap from our house to the ground." "'A good work indeed, my boy,' said I, "'is yours, for it has saved us. God has inspired you and has made use of the hand of a child for our preservation. Your conductor shall remain where you so happily placed it. We may still have need of it. 
The sky still looks very threatening. Let us return to your mother, and take a light with us." I had contrived a sort of portable lantern made of isinglass, which lighted us in our offices. Moreover, a calabash pierced with small holes, with a candle inside, was placed at the top of the winding staircase, and lighted it entirely, so that we were able to descend without danger by night as well as by day. I was, however, uneasy about the way we should bring my wife down, if we found it necessary to remove her during her sickness. I named it to Fritz. "'Have no uneasiness, father,' said he. "'Ernest and I are very strong now, and we can carry Mama like a feather.' "'You and I might, my dear boy,' said I. "'But Ernest cannot be of much assistance to us at present.' I then related his misfortune to them. They were distressed and astonished, not comprehending the cause which I promised to explain. They wished now, however, to see their brother. Fritz then requested, in a low tone of voice, that he might go to Tent House, to see if the vessel and the captain had arrived. Seeing his brothers listening with curiosity, I thought it best to tell them the affair, requesting them, however, not to name it to their mother at present. Jack, who was now about fourteen years of age, listened with a most intense interest, his eyes sparkling with joy and surprise. "'A vessel! People from Europe! Do you think they've come to seek us? Perhaps they are our relations and friends.' "'How glad should I be,' said Francis, "'if my good grandmamma were there. She loved me so much, and was always giving me sweetmeats.' This was the mother of my dear wife, from whom she had parted with extreme regret. I knew that a single word from the child would have relieved all her sorrows, and would in her present state be dangerous. I therefore forbade him naming such a thing to his mother, even if we mentioned the vessel. We ascended, and found our dear patient awake, with Ernest at her side, his hand tied up, and somewhat relieved, though, from not having applied the water immediately, there were several blisters, which he requested me to open. It was necessary to tell his mother he had had a burn. She named several remedies, and I was hesitating which to use, when Fritz, giving me a significant glance, said, don't you think, father, that the leaves of the carata, which cured Jack's legs so well, would be as serviceable to Ernest's hand? I have no doubt of it, said I. But we have none here. I know very well where they grow, said he. Come, Jack, we shall soon be there. We shall have a little rain, but what of that? We shall not be melted, and we can have a bath. My wife was divided between her desire to relieve Ernest and her fear of the boys venturing out in such a stormy night. She agreed at last, provided Jack had my cloak and Fritz the boots, and that they should take the lantern. Thus equipped, they set out. I accompanied them outside the tree, Fritz assuring me they would be back in three hours at most. He intended to proceed along the rocks towards Tent House, to make what observations he could for, as he told me, he could not get the poor captain and his vessel out of his head. It was now seven o'clock. I gave them my blessing, and left them with injunctions to be prudent, and returned with an anxious heart to my invalids. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann David Wyss Chapter 35 On entering I found Francis sitting on his mother's bed, telling her the story of the lightning, of the wire which was called a conductor, of the figs that he was going to gather for her and that papa had called him, little Francis, the preserver of the whole family. Having briefly explained to them the results of Francis's fortunate device, I procured some raw potato to apply to Ernest's hand, which still gave him great pain, and bathed my wife's foot with some eau d'arcubusade, which I procured from my medicine chest. Here I also met with some laudanum, a few drops of which I infused into the lemonade, 
wishing her to sleep till her sons returned. She soon was in a sweet slumber. The boys followed her example, and I was left alone with my anxieties, happy, however, to see them at rest after such an evening of agitation. The hours passed. Still my children returned not. I was continually at the window, listening for their steps, or the sounds of their voices. I heard only the rain falling in torrents, the waves breaking against the rocks, and the wind howling frightfully. I could not help thinking of the danger they ran, having twice to cross the river, which was doubtless swollen by the rain. I was not so much alarmed for Fritz, a strong, bold youth of nineteen years of age, and a determined hunter. As for poor Jack, bold even to rashness, and having neither strength nor experience to secure him, I could not help fancying him carried away by the stream, and his brother not daring to return without him. My wife occasionally awoke, but the narcotic stupefied her. She still did not perceive the absence of her sons. Francis slept tranquilly, but when Ernest awoke, and heard the tempest so terribly augmented, he was almost distracted. All his selfishness, all his indolence disappeared. He entreated me to allow him to go in search of his brothers, and with difficulty I detained him. To convince him that he was not the sole cause of the danger of Fritz and Jack, I related to him, for the first time, the history of the boat and the vessel, and assured him that the great cause of their anxiety to go over to Tent House was to search for some traces of the unfortunate seamen and their vessel, exposed to that furious sea. "'And Fritz also is exposed to that sea,' cried Ernest. "'I know it! I am sure that he is at this moment in his canoe, struggling against the waves!' "'And Jack, my poor Jack,' sighed I, infected with his fears. "'No, father,' added Ernest, "'be composed. Fritz will not be so imprudent. He will have left Jack in our house at the rock, and probably, seeing the hopelessness of his undertaking, he has returned himself now, and is waiting there till the stream subsides a little. Do allow me to go, dear father. You have ordered me cold water for my burnt hand, and it will certainly cure it to get it well wet. I could not consent to expose my third son to the tempest, which was now become frightful. The sailcloth which covered our window was torn into a thousand pieces, and carried away. The rain, like a deluge, forced itself into our dwelling, even to the bed where my wife and child were lying. I could neither make up my mind to leave them myself in this perilous situation, nor to spare my boy, who could not even be of any use to his brothers. I commanded him to remain, succeeded in persuading him of their probable safety, and induced him to lie down to rest. Now, in my terrible solitude, I turn to him who tempers the wind to the shorn lamb, who forbids us not to address him and the trials he sends us, to beseech him to soften them, or to give us strength to bear them. Kneeling down, I dared to supplicate him to restore me my children, submissively adding, after the example of our blessed Saviour, Yet not my will, but thine be done, O Lord. My prayers appeared to be heard. The storm gradually abated and the day began to break. I awoke Ernest, and having dressed his wounded hand, he set out for Tent House in search of his brothers. I followed him with my eyes, as far as I could see. The whole country appeared one vast lake, and the road to Tent House was like the bed of a river. But, protected by his good gaiters of buffalo-skin, he proceeded fearlessly, and was soon out of my sight. I was recalled from the window by the voice of my wife, who was awake, and anxiously inquiring for her sons. "'They are gone,' said I, to gather the leaves of the carotta for Ernest's burnt hand, and he wished to go too. Her deep sleep had entirely chased from her memory all the events of the previous evening, and I was glad to allow Francis to repeat his little tale of the burn and his conductor in order to gain time. She was astonished and uneasy to hear of Ernest's accident, and was afraid he would get wet in searching for the carotta, little aware of the hours of anguish I had endured waiting and watching for those she believed had only just left home. 
At that moment the dear and well-known voices were heard under the great window. "'Father, I'm bringing back my brothers!' cried Ernest. "'Yes, papa, we are all alive, and wet as fishes!' added the sweet voice of Jack. "'But not without having had our troubles,' said the manly voice of Fritz. I rushed down the staircase to meet them, and, embracing them, I led them, trembling with emotion, to the bed of their mother, who could not comprehend the transport of joy I expressed. "'Dear Elizabeth,' said I, "'here are our sons. God has given them to us a second time.' "'Have we then been in any danger of losing them?' said she. "'What is the meaning of this?' They saw their mother was unconscious of their long absence, and assured her it was only the storm which had so completely wetted them, that it alarmed me. I hastened to get them to change their clothes, and go to bed a little while to rest themselves, as, however anxious I was myself, I wished to prepare my wife for their recital, and also to tell her of the vessel. Jack would not go till he had produced his bundle of the carotta leaves. "'There is enough for six and thirty thunderstorms,' said he, "'and I will prepare them. I have had some experience with my own, and I know the best method.' He soon divided one of the leaves with his knife, after cutting away the triangular thorn from the end, and applied it to his brother's hand, binding it with his handkerchief. Having completed this dressing, he threw off his clothes, and, jumping into his bed, he and his brothers were sound asleep in ten minutes. I then sat down by my wife, and began my tale, from my first view of the vessel, and my anxious watching for intercourse with it in order that we might take the opportunity to return to Europe. "'But why should we return to Europe?' said she. "'You want nothing here now, since I have got flax, cotton, and a wheel. Our children lead an active, healthy, and innocent life, and live with us, which they might not do in the world. For four years we have been happy here, and what shall we find in Europe to compensate us for what we leave here? Poverty? War? and none of those things which we have here abundantly. "'But we should find Grandmama," said little Francis, and stopped recollecting my prohibition. He had, however, said sufficient to bring tears to his mother's eyes. "'You are right, my darling,' said she. "'That is my sole regret. But my dear parent was aged and infirm. In all probability I should no longer find her in this world. And if removed to heaven, she watches over us in this island, as well as if we were in Europe." After my dear wife had subdued the agitation this remembrance caused her, I pursued the conversation as follows. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann David Wyss Chapter 36 I see, my dear wife, said I, that you, as well as the rest of my family, are contented to remain on this island, where it seems it is the will of God for us to dwell, as it is improbable that in such a tempest Captain Johnson would risk approaching the island if indeed it has not already been fatal to him. I am impatient to learn if Fritz has any tidings of him, for it was on the shore near Tent House that he and Jack passed the night. "'Well done, my good and courageous boys,' said their mother. "'They might at any rate have given assistance to them if wrecked.' "'You are more courageous than I am, my dear Elizabeth,' answered I. "'I have passed the whole night mourning for my children.' and you think only of the good they might have done to their fellow-creatures." My sons were awake by this time, and I eagerly inquired if they had discovered any traces of the vessel. Fritz said they had not, but he feared it would never be able to resist the fury of the tempest. "'No, indeed,' said Jack. "'Those mountains of waves, which were not fixtures like other mountains, came full gallop to swallow up Fritz the Great, Jack the Little, and their fine canoe. My wife nearly fainted when she heard they had ventured on that terrible sea, 
and I reminded Fritz that I had forbidden him to do this. "'But you have often said to me, Papa,' said he, "'do unto others as you would they should do unto you, and what a happiness it would have been to us when our vessel was wrecked if we had seen a canoe!' with two bold men coming to our assistance," said Jack. But go on with your story, Fritz. Fritz continued. We proceeded first to the rocks, and with some difficulty, and not until Jack had shed some blood in the cause, we secured the karata leaves with their ugly thorns at the end. When our sack was full, we proceeded along the rocks towards Tent House. From this height I tried to discover the ship but the darkness obscured everything. Once I thought I perceived at a great distance a fixed light, which was neither a star nor the lightning, and which I lost sight of occasionally. We had now arrived at the cascade, which, from the noise, seemed much swollen by the rain. Our great stones were quite hidden by a boiling foam. I would have attempted to cross, if I had been alone, but with Jack on my shoulders I was afraid of the risk. I therefore prepared to follow the course of the river to Family Bridge. The wet ground continually brought us on our knees, and with great difficulty we reached the bridge. But judge of our consternation! The river had risen so much that the planks were covered, and as we conceived the whole was destroyed. I then told Jack to return to Falcon's Nest with the Karata leaves and I would swim across the river. I returned about a hundred yards up the stream to find a wider and less rapid part, and easily crossed. Judge of my surprise when I saw a human figure approaching to meet me. I had no doubt it was the captain of the vessel, and— "'And it was Captain Jack, sans peur et sans reproche,' said the bold little fellow. I was determined not to return home a poltroon who was afraid of the water. When Fritz was gone I tried the bridge, and soon found there was not sufficient water over it to risk my being drowned. I took off my boots, which might have made me slip, and my cloak, which was too heavy, and, making a dart, I ran with all my strength across and reached the other side. I put on my boots, which I had in my hands, and advanced to meet Fritz who called out as soon as he saw me, "'Is that you, Captain?' I tried to say, "'Yes, certainly,' in a deep tone, but my laughter betrayed me. "'To my great regret,' said Fritz, "'I should truly have preferred meeting Captain Johnson. But I fear he and his people are at the bottom of the sea. After meeting with Jack, we proceeded to Tent House, where we kindled a good fire, and dried ourselves a little.' We then refreshed ourselves with some wine which remained on the table where you had entertained the captain, and proceeded to prepare a signal to inform the vessel we were ready to receive them. We procured a thick bamboo cane from the magazine. I fixed firmly to one end of it the large lantern of the fish's bladder you gave us to take. I filled the lamp with oil, and placed in it a thick cotton wick, which, when lighted, was very brilliant. Jack and I then placed it on the shore at the entrance of the bay. We fixed it before the rock, where the land wind would not reach it, sunk it three or four feet into the ground, steadied it with stones, and then went to rest over our fire after this long and difficult labour. After drying ourselves a little, we set out on our return, when, looking towards the sea, we were startled by the appearance of the same light we had noticed before. We heard, at the same time, the distant report of a gun, which was repeated three or four times at irregular intervals. We were persuaded that it was the vessel calling to us for aid, and, remembering the command of our Saviour, we thought you would forgive our disobedience if we presented to you in the morning the captain, the lieutenant, and as many as our canoe would contain. We entered it then without any fear for you know how light and well-balanced it is. And, rowing into the bay, the sail was spread to the wind, and we had no more trouble. I then took the helm, my own signal-light shone clearly on the shore, and, except for the rain which fell in torrents, the waves which washed over our canoe, and uneasiness about the ship and about you, 
and our fear that the wind might carry us into the open sea, we should have had a delightful little maritime excursion. When we got out of the bay, I perceived the wind was driving us towards Shark Island, which, being directly before the bay, forms two entrances to it. I intended to go round it and disembark there, if possible, that I might look out for some trace of the ship. But we found this impossible. The sea ran too high. Besides, we should have been unable to moor our canoe, the island not affording a single tree or anything we could lash it to, and the waves would soon have carried it away. We had now lost sight of the light, and hearing no more signals, I began to think on your distress when we did not arrive at the hour we promised. I therefore resolved to return by the other side of the bay, carefully avoiding the current which would have carried us into the open sea. I lowered the sail by means of the ropes you had fixed to it, and we rowed into port. We carefully moored the canoe, and, without returning to Tent House, took the road home. We crossed the bridge as Jack had done, found the waterproof cloak and bag of karata leaves where he had left them, and soon after met Ernest. As it was daylight I did not take him for the captain, but knew him immediately and felt the deepest remorse when I heard from him in what anxiety and anguish you had passed the night. Our enterprise was imprudent, and altogether useless. But we might have saved life, which would have been an ample remuneration. I fear all is hopeless. What do you think, father, of their fate?" "'I hope they are far from this dangerous coast,' said I but if still in our neighbourhood, we will do all we can to assist them. As soon as the tempest is subsided, we will take the pinnace and sail round the island. You have long urged me to this, Fritz, and who knows but that on the opposite side we may find some traces of our own poor sailors, perhaps even meet with them." The weather gradually clearing, I called my sons to go out with me. My wife earnestly besought me not to venture on the sea. I assured her it was not sufficiently calm, but we must examine our plantations, to ascertain what damage was done, and at the same time we might look out for some traces of the wreck. Besides, our animals were becoming clamorous for food. Therefore, leaving Ernest with her, we descended to administer in the first place to their wants. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith, of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Swiss Family Robinson, by Johann David Wyss. Chapter 37 Our animals were impatiently expecting us. They had been neglected during the storm, and were ill-supplied with food, besides being half sunk in water. The ducks and the flamingo liked it well enough, and were swimming comfortably in the muddy water, but the quadrupeds were complaining aloud, each in his own proper language, and making a frightful confusion of sounds. Valiant especially, the name Francis had bestowed on the calf I had given him to bring up, bleated incessantly for his young master, and could not be quieted till he came. It is wonderful how this child, only twelve years old, had tamed and attached this animal, though sometimes so fierce, with him he was as mild as a lamb. The boy rode on his back, guiding him with a little stick with which he just touched the side of his neck as he wished him to move, but if his brothers had ventured to mount, they would have been certainly thrown off. A pretty sight was our cavalry, Fritz on his handsome Monagra, Jack on his huge buffalo, and Francis on his young bull. There was nothing left for Ernest but the donkey, and its slow and peaceful habits suited him very well. Francis ran up to his favourite, who showed his delight at seeing him as well as he was able, and at the first summons followed his master from the stable. Fritz brought out Lightfoot, Jack his buffalo and I followed with the cow and the ass. We left them to sport about at liberty on the humid earth, till we removed the water from their stable, and supplied them with fresh food. We then drove them in, 
considering it advisable to pursue our expedition on foot, lest the bridge should still be overflowed. Francis was the superintendent of the fowls, and knew every little chicken by name. He called them out and scattered their food for them, and soon had his beautiful and noisy family fluttering round him. After having made all our animals comfortable, and given them their breakfast, we began to think of our own. Francis made a fire and warmed some chicken broth for his mother. For ourselves, we were contented with some new milk, some salt herrings, and cold potatoes. I had often searched in my excursions for the precious breadfruit tree, so highly spoken of by modern travellers, which I had hoped might be found in our island from its favourable situation, but I had hitherto been unsuccessful. We were unable to procure the blessing of bread. Our ship biscuit had long been exhausted, and though we had sown our European corn, we had not yet reaped any. After we had together knelt down to thank God for our merciful protection through the terrors of the past night, and we besought Him to continue it, we prepared to set out. The waves still ran high, though the wind had subsided, and we determined merely to go along the shore, as the road still continued impassable from the rain, and the sand was easier to walk on than the wet grass. Besides, our principal motive for the excursion was to search for any traces of a recent shipwreck. At first we could discover nothing, even with a telescope, but Fritz, mounting a high rock, fancied he discovered something floating towards the island. He besought me to allow him to take the canoe, which was still where he had left it on the preceding night. As the bridge was now easy to cross, I consented only insisting on accompanying him to assist in managing it. Jack, who was much afraid of being left behind, was the first to leap in and seize an oar. There was, however, no need of it. I steered my little boat into the current, and we were carried away with such velocity as almost to take our breath. Fritz was at the helm, and appeared to have no fear. I will not say his father was so tranquil. I held Jack for fear of accidents but he only laughed, and observed to his brother that the canoe galloped better than Lightfoot. We were soon in the open sea, and directed our canoe towards the object we had remarked, and which we still had in sight. We were afraid it was the boat upset, but it proved to be a tolerably large cask, which had probably been thrown overboard to lighten the distressed vessel. We saw several others, but neither mast nor plank to give us any idea that the vessel and boat had perished. Fritz wished much to have made the circuit of the island, to assure ourselves of this, but I would not hear of it. I thought of my wife's terror. Besides, the sea was still too rough for our frail bark, and we had, moreover, no provisions. If my canoe had not been well built, it would have run great risk of being overset by the waves, which broke over it. Jack, when he saw one coming, lay down on his face, saying he preferred having them on his back rather than in his mouth. He jumped up as soon as it passed to help to empty the canoe, till another wave came to fill it again. But, thanks to my outriggers, we preserved our balance very well, and I consented to go as far as Cape Disappointment, which merited the name a second time. For we found no trace here of the vessel, though we mounted the hill and thus commanded a wide extent of view. As we looked round the country, it appeared completely devastated, trees torn up by the roots, plantations levelled with the ground, water collected into absolute lakes, all announced desolation, and the tempest seemed to be renewing. The sky was darkened, the wind arose, and was unfavourable for our return nor could I venture the canoe upon the waves. Every instant it was becoming more formidable. We moored our bark to a large palm-tree we found at the foot of the hill, near the shore, and set out by land to our home. We crossed the gourd wood and the wood of monkeys, and arrived at our farm, which we found, to our great satisfaction, had not suffered much from the storm. The food we had left in the stables was nearly consumed from which we concluded that the animals we had left here had sheltered themselves during the storm. 
we refilled the mangers with the hay we had preserved in the loft, and, observing the sky getting more and more threatening, we set out without delay for our house, from which we were yet a considerable distance, to avoid Flamingo Marsh, which was towards the sea, and Rice Marsh, towards the rock, we determined to go through Cotton Wood, which would save us from the wind which was ready to blow us off our feet. I was still uneasy about the ship, which the lieutenant had told me was out of repair, but I indulged a hope that they might have taken refuge in some bay or found anchorage on some hospitable shore, where they might get their vessel into order. Jack was alarmed lest they should fall into the hands of the anthropophagi, who eat men like hares or sheep, of which he had read in some book of travels, and excited the ridicule of his brother, who was astonished at his ready belief of travellers' tales, which he asserted were usually false. "'But Robinson Crusoe would not tell a falsehood,' said Jack indignantly. "'And there were cannibals came to his island, and were going to eat Friday if he had not saved him.' "'Oh, Robinson could not tell a falsehood,' said Fritz, "'because he never existed. The whole history is a romance. Is that not the name, father, that is given to works of the imagination?' "'It is,' said I. "'But we must not call Robinson Crusoe a romance.' The Robinson himself, and all the circumstances of his history, are probably fictitious. The details are all founded on truth, on the adventures and descriptions of voyagers who may be depended upon, and unfortunate individuals who have actually been wrecked on unknown shores. If ever our journal should be printed, many may believe that it is only a romance, a mere work of the imagination. My boys hoped we should not have to introduce any savages into our romance, and were astonished that an island so beautiful had not tempted any to inhabit it. In fact, I had often been myself surprised at this circumstance, but I told them many voyagers had noticed islands apparently fertile, and yet uninhabited. Besides, the chain of rocks which surrounded this might prevent the approach of savages unless they had discovered the little bay of safety where we had landed. Fritz said he anxiously desired to circumnavigate the island, in order to ascertain the size of it, and if there were similar chains of rocks on the opposite side. I promised him, as soon as the stormy weather was past, and his mother well enough to remove to Tent House, we would take our pinnace and set out on our little voyage. We now approached the marsh, and he begged me to let him go and cut some canes, as he projected making a sort of carriage for his mother. As we were collecting them, he explained his scheme to me. He wished to weave of these reeds, which were very strong, a large and long sort of pannier, in which his mother might sit or recline, and which might be suspended between two strong bamboo canes by handles of rope. He then purposed to yoke two of our most gentle animals, the cow and the ass, the one before and the other behind, between these shafts, the leader to be mounted by one of the children as director, the other would follow naturally, and the good mother would thus be carried, as if in a litter, without any danger of jolting. I was pleased with this idea, and we all set to work to load ourselves each with a huge burden of reeds. They requested me not to tell my wife that they might give her an agreeable surprise. It needed such affection as ours to induce us to the undertaking in such unpropitious weather. It rained in torrents, and the marsh was so soft and wet that we were in danger of sinking at every step. However, I could not be less courageous than my sons, whom nothing daunted, and we soon made up our bundles, and— placing them on our heads, we formed a sort of umbrella which was not without its benefits. We soon arrived at Falcon's Nest. Before we reached the tree, I saw a fire shine to such a distance that I was alarmed, but soon found it was only meant for our benefit by our kind friends at home. When my wife saw the rain falling, she had instructed her little assistant to make a fire in our usual cooking-place at a little distance from the tree, 
and protected by a canopy of waterproof cloth from the rain. The young cook had not only kept up a good fire to dry us on our return, but had taken the opportunity of roasting two dozen of those excellent little birds which his mother had preserved in butter, and which, all arranged on the old sword which served us as a spit, was just ready for our arrival, and the fire and feast were equally grateful to the hungry, exhausted, and wet travellers who sat down to enjoy them. However, before we sat down to our repast, we went up to see our invalids, whom we found tolerably well, though anxious for our return. Ernest, with his sound hand, and the assistance of Francis, has succeeded in forming a sort of rampart before the opening into the room, composed of the four hammocks in which he and his brothers slept, placed side by side on end. This sufficiently protected them from the rain, but excluded the light so that they had been obliged to light a candle, and Ernest had been reading to his mother in a book of voyages that had formed part of the captain's small library. It was a singular coincidence that while we were talking of the savages on the way home, they were also reading of them, and I found my dear wife much agitated by the fears these accounts had awakened in her mind. After soothing her terrors, I returned to the fire to dry myself, and to enjoy my repast. Besides the birds, Francis had prepared fresh eggs and potatoes for us. He told me that his mamma had given up her office of cook to him, and assured me that he would perform the duties to our satisfaction, provided he was furnished with materials. Fritz was to hunt, Jack to fish, I was to order dinner, and he would make it ready. "'And when we have neither game nor fish,' said Jack, "'we will attack your poultry-yard.' That was not at all to the taste of poor little Francis, who could not bear his favourites to be killed, and who had actually wept over the chicken that was slaughtered to make broth for his mother. We were obliged to promise him that, when other resources failed, we would apply to our barrels of salt fish. He, however, gave us leave to dispose as we liked of the ducks and geese, which were too noisy for him. After we had concluded our repast, we carried a part of it to our friends above, and proceeded to give them an account of our expedition. I then secured the hammock somewhat more firmly, to save us from the storm that was still raging, and the hour of rest being at hand, my sons established themselves on mattresses of cotton made by their kind mother, and in spite of the roaring winds, we were soon in profound repose. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. THE SWISS FAMILY ROBINSON by Johann David Wyss CHAPTER Thirty Eight. The storm continued to rage the whole of the following day, and even the day after with the same violence. Happily our tree stood firm, though several branches were broken, amongst others that to which Francis's wire was suspended. I replaced it with more care, carried it beyond our roof and fixed at the extremity the pointed instrument which had attracted the lightning. I then substituted for the hammocks before the window strong planks, which remained for my building, and which my sons assisted me to raise with pulleys, after having sawed them to the proper length. Through these I made loopholes, to admit the light and air. In order to carry off the rain, I fixed a sort of spout, made of the wood of a tree I had met with, which was unknown to me though apparently somewhat like the elder. The whole of the tree, almost to the bark, was filled up with a sort of pith, easily removed. From this tree I made the pipes for our fountain, and the remainder was now useful for these rain-spouts. I employed those days in which I could not go out, in separating the seeds and grain, of which I saw we should have need, and in mending our work-tools. My sons, in the meantime, nestled under the tree among the roots, 
were incessantly employed in the construction of the carriage for their mother. The Karatas had nearly completed the cure of Ernest's hand, and he was able to assist his brothers preparing the canes, which Fritz and Jack wove between the flat wooden wands with which they had made the frame of their pannier. They succeeded in making it so strong and close that they might have carried liquids in it. My dear wife's foot and leg were gradually improving, and I took the opportunity of her confinement to reason with her on her false notion of the dangers of the sea, and to represent to her the gloomy prospect of our sons if they were left alone in the island. She agreed with me, but could not resolve to leave it. She hoped God would send some vessel to us which might leave us some society, and after all, if our sons were left, she pointed out to me, that they had our beautiful pinnace, and might at any time of their own accord leave the island. "'And why should we anticipate the evils of futurity, my dear friend?' said she. "'Let us think only of the present. I am anxious now to know if the storm has spared my fine kitchen-garden.' "'You must wait a little,' said I. "'I am as uneasy as you, for my maize plantations, my sugar-canes, and my cornfields.' At last, one night, the storm ceased, the clouds passed away, and the moon showed herself in all her glory. How delighted we were! My wife got me to remove the large planks I had placed before the opening, and the bright moonbeams streamed through the branches of the tree into our room. A gentle breeze refreshed us, and so delighted were we in gazing on that sky of promise, that we could scarcely bear to go to bed but spent half the night in projects for the morrow. The good mother alone said that she could not join in our excursions. Jack and Francis smiled at each other, as they thought of their litter, which was now nearly finished. A bright sun awoke us early next morning. Fritz and Jack had requested me to allow them to finish their carriage, so, leaving Ernest with his mother, I took Francis with me to ascertain the damage done to the garden at Tent House, about which his mother was so anxious. We easily crossed the bridge, but the water had carried away some of the planks. However, my little boy leaped from one plank to another with great agility, although the distance was sometimes considerable. He was so proud of being my sole companion that he scarcely touched the ground as he ran on before me. But he had a sad shock when he got to the garden, of which we could not find the slightest trace. All was destroyed. The walks, the fine vegetable beds, the plantations of pines and melons, all had vanished. Francis stood like a marble statue, as pale and still, till, bursting into tears, he recovered himself. "'Oh, my good mamma," said he, "'what will she say when she hears of this misfortune?' But she need not know it, papa," added he, after a pause. It would distress her too much, and if you and my brothers will help me, we will repair the damage before she can walk. The plants may not be so large, but the earth is moist, and they will grow quickly, and I will work hard to get it into order." I embraced my dear boy, and promised him this should be our first work. I feared we should have many other disasters to repair but a child of twelve years old gave me an example of resignation and courage. We agreed to come next day to begin our labour, for the garden was too well situated for me to abandon it. It was on a gentle declivity at the foot of the rocks, which sheltered it from the north wind, and was conveniently watered from the cascade. I resolved to add a sort of bank or terrace to protect it from the violent rains, and Francis was so pleased with the idea that he began to gather the large stones which were scattered over the garden, and to carry them to the place where I wished to build my terrace. He would have worked all day, if I had allowed him, but I wanted to look after my young plantations, my sugar-canes, and my fields, and after the destruction I had just witnessed, I had everything to fear. I proceeded to the avenue of fruit-trees that led to Tent House, and was agreeably surprised. All were half bowed to the ground, as well as the bamboos that supported them, but few were torn up, and I saw that my sons and I, 
with a labour of two or three days, could restore them. Some of them had already begun to bear fruit, but all was destroyed for this year. This was, however, a trifling loss compared with what I had anticipated, for having no more plants of European fruits, I could not have replaced them. Besides having resolved to inhabit Tent House at present, entirely, being there defended from storms, it was absolutely necessary to contrive some protection from the heat. My new plantations afforded little shade yet, and I trembled to propose to my wife to come and inhabit these burning rocks. Francis was gathering some of the beautiful unknown flowers of the island for his mother, and when he had formed his nosegay, bringing it to me, "'See, papa,' said he, "'how the rain has refreshed these flowers. I wish it would rain still. It is so dreadfully hot here. Oh, if we had but a little shade!' that is just what i was thinking of my dear said i we shall have shade enough when my trees are grown but in the meantime in the meantime papa said francis i will tell you what you must do you must make a very long broad colonnade before our house covered with cloth and open before so that mamma may have air and shade at once i was pleased with my son's idea and promised him to construct a gallery soon, and call it the Franciade, in honour of him. My little boy was delighted that his suggestion should be thus approved, and begged me not to tell his mamma, as he wished to surprise her, as much as his brothers did with their carriage, and he hoped the Franciade might be finished before she visited Tent House. I assured him I would be silent, and we took the road hence talking about our new colonnade. I projected making it in the most simple and easy way. A row of strong bamboo canes planted at equal distances along the front of our house, and united by a plank of wood at the top, cut into arches between the canes. Others I would place sloping from the rock, to which I would fasten them by iron cramps. These were to be covered with sailcloth, prepared with the elastic gum, and well secured to the plank. This building would not take much time, and I anticipated the pleasure of my wife when she found out that it was an invention of her little favourite, who, of a mild and reflecting disposition, was beloved by us all. As we walked along, we saw something approaching, that Francis soon discovered to be his brother's, with her new carriage, and concluding that his mamma occupied it, he hastened to meet them, lest they should proceed to the garden. But on our approach we discovered that Ernest was in the litter, which was borne by the cow before, on which Fritz was mounted, and by the ass behind, with Jack on it. Ernest declared the conveyance was so easy and delightful that he should often take his mother's place. "'I like that very much,' said Jack. "'Then I will take care that we will harness the onagra and the buffalo for you and they will give you a pretty jolting, I promise you. The cow and ass are only for Mama. Look, Papa, is it not complete? We wished to try it as soon as we finished it, so we got Ernest to occupy it while Mother was asleep. Ernest declared it only wanted two cushions, one to sit upon, the other to recline against, to make it perfect. And though I could not help smiling at his love of ease, I encouraged the notion in order to delay my wife's excursion till our plans were completed. I then put Francis into the carriage beside his brother, and ordering Fritz and Jack to proceed with their equipage to inspect our cornfields, I returned to my wife, who was still sleeping. On her awaking, I told her the garden and plantations would require a few days' labour to set them in order, and I should leave Ernest, who was not yet in condition to be a labourer, to nurse her and read to her. My sons returned in the evening, and gave me a melancholy account of our cornfields. The corn was completely destroyed, and we regretted this the more, as we had very little left for seed. We had anticipated a feast of real bread, but we were obliged to give up all hope for this year, and to content ourselves with our cakes of cassava and with potatoes. The maize had suffered less, 
and might have been a resource for us, but the large hard grain was so difficult to reduce to flour fine enough for dough. Fritz often recurred to the necessity of building a mill near the cascade at Tent House, but this was not the work of a moment, and we had time to consider of it, for at present we had no corn to grind. As I found Francis had let his brothers into all our secrets, it was agreed that I, with Fritz, Jack, and Francis, should proceed to Tent House next morning. Francis desired to be of the party, that he might direct the laying out of the garden, he said, with an important air, as he had been his mother's assistant on its formation. We arranged our bag of vegetable seeds, and having bathed my wife's foot with a simple embrocation, we offered our united prayers, and retired to our beds to prepare ourselves for the toils of the next day. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann David Wyss. Chapter 39 We rose early, and after our usual morning duties, we left our invalids for the whole day taking with us for our dinner a goose and some potatoes, made ready the evening before. We harnessed the bull and the buffalo to the cart, and I sent Fritz and Jack to the wood of bamboos, with orders to load the cart with as many as it would contain, and especially to select some very thick ones for my colonnade. The rest I intended for props for my young trees, and this I proposed to be my first undertaking. Francis would have preferred beginning with the Franciade, or the garden, but he was finally won over by the thoughts of the delicious fruits which we might lose by our neglect, the peaches, plums, pears, and above all the cherries, of which he was very fond. He then consented to assist me in holding the trees whilst I replaced the roots, after which he went to cut the reeds to tie them. Suddenly I heard him cry. Papa, papa, there is a large chest come for us. Come and take it. I ran to him, and saw it was the very chest we had seen floating, and which we had taken for the boat at a distance. The waves had left it in our bay, entangled in the reeds, which grew abundantly here. It was almost buried in the sand. We could not remove it alone, and, notwithstanding our curiosity, we were compelled to wait for the arrival of my sons. We returned to our work, and it was pretty well advanced when the tired and hungry party returned with their cartload of bamboos. We rested, and sat down to eat our goose. Guavas and sweet acorns, which had escaped the storm, and which my sons brought, completed our repast. Fritz had killed a large bird in the marsh, which I took at first for a young flamingo, but it was a young cassowary, the first I had seen in the island. This bird is remarkable for its extraordinary size, and for its plumage so short and fine that it seems rather to be hair than feathers. I should have liked to have had it alive to ornament our poultry-yard, and it was so young we might have tamed it. But Fritz's unerring aim had killed it at once. I wished to let my wife see this rare bird, which, if standing on its webbed feet, would have been four feet high. I therefore forbade them to meddle with it. As we ate, we talked of the chest, and our curiosity being stronger than our hunger, we swallowed our repast hastily, and then ran down to the shore. We were obliged to plunge into the water up to the waist, and then had some difficulty to extricate it from the weed and slime, and to push it on shore. No sooner had we placed it in safety than Fritz, with a strong hatchet, forced it open, and we all eagerly crowded to see the contents. Fritz hoped it would be powder and firearms. Jack, who was somewhat fond of dress, had had notions of elegance, declared in favour of clothes, and particularly of linen, finer and whiter than that which his mother wove. If Ernest had been there, books would have been his desire. For my own part, there was nothing I was more anxious for than European seeds, 
particularly corn. Francis had a lingering wish that this chest might contain some of those gingerbread cakes which his grandmamma used to treat him with in Europe, and which he had often regretted, but he kept this wish to himself, for fears his brothers should call him Little Glutton, and assured us that he should like a little pocket-knife with a small saw better than anything in the world, and he was the only one who had his wish. The chest was opened, and we saw that it was filled with a number of trifling things likely to tempt savage nations, and to become the means of exchange, principally glass and ironware, coloured beads, pins, needles, looking-glasses, children's toys, constructed as models, such as carts, and tools of every sort, amongst which we found some likely to be useful, such as hatchets, saws, planes, gimlets, etc., besides a collection of knives, of which Francis had the choice, and scissors, which were reserved for Mamma, her own being nearly worn out. I had, moreover, the pleasure of finding a quantity of nails of every size and kind, besides iron hooks, staples, etc., which I needed greatly. After we had examined the contents, and selected what we wanted immediately, we closed up the chest and conveyed it to our magazine at Tent House. We had spent so much time in our examination that we had some difficulty to finish propping our trees and to arrive at home before it was dark. We found my wife somewhat uneasy at our lengthened absence, but our appearance soon calmed her. Mother, said I, I have brought back all your chickens to crowd under your wing. And we have not come back empty-handed said Jack. Look, Mama, here are a beautiful pair of scissors, a large paper of needles, another of pins, and a thimble. How rich you are now! And when you get well, you can make me a pretty waistcoat and a pair of trousers, for I am in great want of them. And I, Mama, said Francis, have brought you a mirror, that you may arrange your cap. You have often been sorry Papa did not remember to bring one from the ship. This was intended for the savages, and I will begin with you. I believe I rather resemble one now, said my good Elizabeth, arranging the red and yellow silk handkerchief which she usually wore on her head. Only, Mamma, said Jack, when you wear the comical pointed bonnet which Ernest made you. What matters it, said she, whether it be pointed or round? It will protect me from the sun and it is the work of my Ernest, to whom I am much obliged. Ernest, with great ingenuity and patience, had endeavoured to plate his mother a bonnet of the rice-straw. He had succeeded, but not knowing how to form the round crown, he was obliged to finish it in a point, to the great and incessant diversion of his brothers. Mother, said Ernest, in his usual grave and thoughtful tone, I should not like you to look like a savage, therefore as soon as I regain the use of my hand, my first work shall be to make you a bonnet, which I will take care shall be formed with a round crown, as you will lend me one of your large needles, and I will take, to sew the crown on, the head of either Jack or Francis. What do you mean, my head? said they both together. <laughs> I don't mean to take it off your shoulders, said he. It will only be necessary that one of you should kneel down before me, for a day perhaps, while I use your head as a model, and you need not cry out much if I should chance to push my needle in. This time the philosopher had the laugh on his side, and his tormentors were silenced. We now explained to my wife where we had found the presents we had brought her. My offerings to her were a light axe, which she could use to cut her firewood with, and an iron kettle, smaller and more convenient than the one she had. Fritz had retired, and now came in dragging with difficulty his huge cassowary. "'Here, Mamma," said he, "'I brought you a little chicken for your dinner.' And the astonishment and laughter again commenced. The rest of the evening was spent in plucking the bird to prepare part of it for the next day. We then retired to rest, that we might begin our labour early next morning. Ernest chose to remain with his books and his mother, for whom he formed with the 
mattresses a sort of reclining chair, in which she was able to sit up in bed and sew. Thus she endured a confinement of six weeks, without complaint, and in that time got all her clothes put into good order. Francis had nearly betrayed our secret once, by asking his mamma to make him a mason's apron. "'A mason's apron?' said she. "'Are you going to build a house, child?' I, "'I meant to say a gardener's apron,' said he. His mamma was satisfied, and promised to comply with his request. In the meantime, my three sons and I laboured assiduously to get the garden into order again, and to raise the terraces, which we hoped might be a defence against future storms. Fritz had also proposed to me to construct a stone conduit, to bring the water to our kitchen garden from the river, to which we might carry it back, after it had passed round our vegetable beds. This was a formidable task, but too useful an affair to be neglected and, aided by the geometrical skill of Fritz, and the ready hands of my two younger boys, the conduit was completed. I took an opportunity, at the same time, to dig a pond above the garden, into which the conduit poured the water. This was always warm with the sun, and, by means of a sluice, we were able to disperse it in little channels to water the garden. The pond would also be useful to preserve small fish and crabs for use. We next proceeded to our embankment. This was intended to protect the garden from any extraordinary overflow of the river, and from the water running from the rocks after heavy rains. We then laid out our garden on the same plan as before, except that I made the walks wider, and not so flat. I carried one directly to our house, which, in the autumn, I intended to plant with shrubs, that my wife might have a shady avenue to approach her garden, where I also planned an arbour, furnished with seats, as a resting place for her. The rocks were covered with numerous climbing plants, bearing every variety of elegant flower, and I had only to make my selection. All this work, with the enclosing the garden with palisades of bamboo, occupied us about a fortnight in which time our invalids made great progress towards their recovery. After the hole was finished, Francis entreated me to begin his gallery. My boys approved of the plan, and Fritz declared that the house was certainly comfortable and commodious, but that it would be wonderfully improved by a colonnade, with a little pavilion at each end, and a fountain in each pavilion. "'I never heard a word of these pavilions,' said I. No, said Jack, they are our own invention. The colonnade will be called the Franciade, and we wish our little pavilions to be named the one Fritzia, and the other Jackia, if you please. I agreed to this reasonable request, and only begged to know how they would procure water for their fountains. Fritz undertook to bring the water, if I would only assist them in completing this little scheme, to give pleasure to their beloved mother. I was charmed to see the zeal and anxiety of my children to oblige their tender mother. Her illness seemed to have strengthened their attachment. They thought only how to console and amuse her. She sometimes told me she really blessed the accident, which had taught her how much she was valued by all around her. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann David Wyss. Chapter 40 The next day was Sunday, our happy Sabbath for repose and quiet conversation at home. After passing the day in our usual devotions and sober reading, my three elder boys requested my permission to walk towards our farm in the evening. On their return they informed me it would be necessary to give a few days' labour to our plantations of maize and potatoes. I therefore determined to look to them. Though I was out early next morning, I found Fritz and Jack had been gone some time. 
leaving only the ass in the stables, which I secured for my own little Francis. I perceived also that they had dismounted my cart, and carried away the wheels, from which I concluded that they had met with some tree in their walk the preceding evening, suitable for the pipes for their fountains, and that they had now returned to cut it down, and convey it to Tent House. As I did not know where to meet with them, I proceeded with Francis on the ass to commence his favourite work. I drew my plan on the ground first. At the distance of twelve feet from the rock which formed the front of our house, I marked a straight line of fifty feet, which I divided into ten spaces of five feet each for my colonnade. The two ends were to be reserved for the two pavilions my sons wished to build. I was busy in my calculations, and Francis placing stakes in the places where I wished to dig, when the cart drove up with our two good labourers. They had, as I expected, found the evening before, a species of pine well adapted for their pipes. They had cut down four, of fifteen or twenty feet in length, which they had brought on the wheels of the cart, drawn by the four animals. They had had some difficulty in transporting them to the place, and the greatest still remained, the boring the trunks, and then uniting them firmly. I had neither augers nor any tools fit for the purpose. I had certainly constructed a little fountain at Falcon's Nest, but the stream was near at hand, and was easily conveyed by our cane pipes to our tortoise-shell basin. Here the distance was considerable, the ground unequal, and to have the water pure and cool, underground pipes were necessary. I thought of large bamboos, but Fritz pointed out the knots, and the difficulty of joining the pieces and begged me to leave it to him, as he had seen fountains made in Switzerland, and had no fears of success. In the meantime all hands set to work at the arcade. We selected twelve bamboos of equal height and thickness, and fixed them securely in the earth at five feet from each other. These formed a pretty colonnade, and were work enough for one day. We took care to divert all inquiries at night, by discussing the subjects which our invalids had been reading during the day. The little library of our captain was very choice. Besides the voyages and travels, which interested them greatly, there was a good collection of historians, and some of the best poets, for which Ernest had no little taste. However, he requested earnestly that he might be of our party next day and Francis good-naturedly offered to stay with Mama, expecting, no doubt, earnest congratulations on the forward state of the Franciade. The next morning Ernest and I set out, his brothers having preceded us. Poor Ernest regretted, as we went, that he had no share in these happy schemes for his mother. I reminded him, however, of his dutiful care of her during her sickness, in all his endeavours to amuse her. "'And besides,' added I, "'did you not make her a straw bonnet?' "'Yes,' said he, "'and I now remember what a frightful shape it was. I will try to make a better, and will go to-morrow morning to choose my straw.' As we approached Tent House we heard a most singular noise echoing at intervals amongst the rocks. We soon discovered the cause. In a hollow of the rocks I saw a very hot fire which Jack was blowing through a cane, whilst Fritz was turning amidst the embers a bar of iron. When it was red-hot they laid it on an anvil I had brought from the ship, and struck it alternately with hammers to bring it to a point. "'Well done, my young smiths,' said I. "'We ought to try all things, and keep what is good. Do you expect to succeed in making your auger?' I suppose that is what you want. Yes, father, said Fritz. We should succeed well enough if we only had a good pair of bellows. You see, we have already got a tolerable point. Now Fritz could not believe anything was impossible. He had killed a kangaroo the evening before, and skinned it. The flesh made us a dinner. Of the skin he determined to make a pair of bellows. He nailed it, with the hair out, not having time to tan it, to two flat pieces of wood, with holes in them. To this he added a reed for the pipe. 
he then fixed it by means of a long cord and a post to the side of his fire, and Jack, with his hand or foot, blew the fire, so that the iron was speedily red-hot and quite malleable. I then showed them how to twist the iron into a screw, rather clumsy, but which would answer the purpose tolerably well. At one end they formed a ring, in which we placed a piece of wood transversely, to enable them to turn the screw. We then made a trial of it. We placed a tree on two props, and Fritz and I managed the auger so well that we had our tree pierced through in a very little time, working first at one end and then at the other. Jack, in the meantime, collected the shavings we made, which he deposited in the kitchen for his mother's use, to kindle the fire. Ernest, meanwhile, was walking about, making observations, and giving his advice to his brothers on the architecture of their pavilions, till, seeing that they were going to bore another tree, he retired into the garden to see the embankment. He returned delighted with the improvements, and much disposed to take some employment. He wanted to assist in boring the tree, but we could not all work at it. I undertook this labour myself, and sent him to blow the bellows, while his brothers laboured at the forge, the work not being too hard for his lame hand. My young smiths were engaged in flattening the iron to make joints to unite their pipes. They succeeded very well, and then began to dig the ground to lay them. Ernest, knowing something of geometry and land surveying, was able to give them some useful hints, which enabled them to complete their work successfully. Leaving them to do this, I employed myself in covering in my long colonnade. After I had placed on my columns a plank cut in arches which united them, and was firmly nailed to them, I extended from it bamboos placed sloping against the rock, and secured to it by cramps of iron the work of my young smiths. When my bamboo roof was solidly fixed, the canes as close as possible, I filled the interstices with a clay I found near the river, and poured gum over it. I had thus an impervious and brilliant roof, which appeared to be varnished, and striped green and brown. I then raised the floor a foot, in order that there might be no damp, and paved it with the square stones I had preserved when we cut the rock. It must be understood that all this was the work of many days. I was assisted by Jack and Fritz, and by Ernest and Francis alternately, one always remaining with his mother, who was still unable to walk. Ernest employed his time, when at home, in making the straw bonnet, without either borrowing his brother's head for a model, or letting any of them know what he was doing. Nevertheless, he assisted his brothers with their pavilions by his really valuable knowledge. They formed them very elegantly something like a Chinese pagoda. They were exactly square, supported on four columns, and rather higher than the gallery. The roofs terminated in a point, and resembled a large parasol. The fountains were in the middle, the basins, breast-high, were formed of the shells of two turtles from our reservoir, which were mercilessly sacrificed for the purpose, and furnished our table abundantly for some days. They succeeded the cassowary, which had supplied us very seasonably. Its flesh tasted like beef, and made excellent soup. But to return to the fountains. Ernest suggested the idea of ornamenting the end of the perpendicular pipe, which brought the water to the basin, with shells. Every sort might be collected on the shore, of the most brilliant colours, and curious and varied shapes. He was passionately devoted to natural history, and had made a collection of these, endeavouring to classify them from the descriptions he met with in the books of voyages and travels. Some of these, of the most dazzling beauty, were placed round the pipe, which had been plastered with clay. From thence the water was received into a volute, shaped like an antique urn, and again was poured gracefully into the large turtle-shell. A small channel conveyed it then out of the pavilions. The whole was completed in less time than I could have imagined, 
and greatly surpassed my expectations, conferring an inestimable advantage on her dwelling, by securing us from the heat. All honour was rendered to Master Francis the inventor, and the Franciade was written in large letters on the middle arch. Fritzia and Jackia were written in the same way over the pavilions. Ernest alone was not named, and he seemed somewhat affected by it. He had acquired a great taste for rambling and botanizing, and had communicated it also to Fritz. And now that our labours were ended at Tent House, they left us to nurse our invalid, and made long excursions together, which lasted sometimes whole days. As they generally returned with some game, or some new fruit, we pardoned their absence, and they were always welcome. Sometimes they brought a kangaroo, sometimes an agouti, the flesh of which resembles that of a rabbit, but is richer. Sometimes they brought wild ducks, pigeons, and even partridges. These were contributed by Fritz, who never went out without his gun and his dogs. Ernest brought us natural curiosities, which amused us much. Stones, crystals, petrifactions, insects, butterflies of rare beauty, and flowers, whose colours and fragrance no one in Europe can form an idea of. Sometimes he brought fruit, which we always administered first to our monkey as taster. Some of them proved very delicious. Two of his discoveries, especially, were most valuable acquisitions the guajaraba, on the large leaf of which one may write with a pointed instrument, and the fruit of which, a sort of grape, is very good to eat. Also the date-palm, every part of which is so useful that we were truly thankful to heaven, and our dear boys for the discovery. Whilst young, the trunk contains a sort of marrow, very delicious. The date-palm is crowned by a head, formed of from forty to eighty leafy branches, which spread round the top. The dates are particularly good about half-dried, and my wife immediately began to preserve them. My sons could only bring the fruit now, but we proposed to transplant some of the trees themselves near our abode. We did not discourage our sons in these profitable expeditions, but they had another aim which I was yet ignorant of. In the meantime, I usually walked with one of my younger sons towards Tent House, to attend to our garden, and to see if our works continued in good condition to receive Mama, who daily improved. But I insisted on her being completely restored before she was introduced to them. Our dwelling looked beautiful amongst the picturesque rocks, surrounded by trees of every sort and facing the smooth and lovely bay of safety. The garden was not so forward as I could have wished, but we were obliged to be patient, and hope for the best. End of chapter.